All right. Hello, good afternoon, and welcome, everybody, to City College of San Francisco and the Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation's third biannual pitch contest. How's everybody doing? Excellent. Excellent. I love the energy. Thank you for that. Um, who's ready to see some really amazing pitches? Wonderful. Uh, we have some exciting pitches, some amazing speakers to hear from, uh, and I'm just going to give you a little bit of a rundown, some background, why we're here, and then I'm going to move us on to our welcome speaker. So my name is Jonathan Berg. I'm an employment and training specialist. I work here at the college, and I help to support our business and finance students in attaining uh, work that, uh, that aligns with their education. I also have the pleasure, and it really is a pleasure, to work with the Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation, uh, getting to see students really actually and create their dreams in the course of a semester through Entrepreneurship 101. It's really, really, really wonderful. Now, I know that you probably heard me say our third biannual pitch contest, but this is actually our first really official event where we not only have the Center for Entrepreneurship, but also Entrepreneurship 101, which is our first class in uh, the Entrepreneurship Department. We're very excited. Uh, and that is really who are uh, the students from that class are the ones that have been creating the pitches, creating startups, and really starting to market and brand their ideas. Ideas, uh, and we're very excited to continue that process today. A little bit of background, the Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation really is uh, in its second semester. Again, this is the first semester we have curriculum aligned with it, but last semester we had uh, a lot of exciting guest lecturers. We had people coming in, able to attain a certificate kind of from those guest le those lectures, and really now we're formalizing it even further. Uh, and just a note, if people are excited about what they see here, we are enrolling currently for Entrepreneurship 101 for next semester, and that is ongoing. So if you're impressed with what you see here. These people just started in the fall semester doing what you're going to see. So if you want to replicate this and get some of this experience, please, please, please enroll. Um, next, none of this happens at all without a lot and a lot of participation from many different people. First of all, we had a demo day last month where all of these uh, startups got to demo their ideas and get feedback. I want to thank you for everyone who came to that and participated in giving feedback, because that helped people get to where they are today to refine their pitches. So thank you. Thank you to all of you. Um, and moving on with gratitude, I really, really, really have to start with Vivian Fastina Pulliam, who is our program coordinator for the Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation, as well as the faculty lead. So none of this would be possible without her. Um, I want to thank, and if you could just raise your hand so we know um, where this amazing support is coming from that ha helped this to happen. Uh, Leah Bello, who is the di business department chair, also real estate faculty and program coordinator. Zach Lamb, who is the Assistant Director of the Strong Workforce Program, who we also want to thank because the Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation is funded through that program. So thank you for heralding this in and making this possible. Uh, we have Alina Verona. Are you here? Associate Dean of Career Pathways. John Halpin, the Dean of Workforce Development and my boss. <laughs> Jesse Lee, get ready the Dean of the Downtown Campus and School of Business, Fashion, Culinary Arts, Child Development, and Environmental Horticulture. <laughs> Edie Cowper, Interim Associate Vice Chancellor of Enrollment Management and Instructional Support Services. Hello. And Tom Bogle, Vice Chancellor of Academic Affairs. And though not here for this event, he's often at our events, and I would be amiss if I did not thank Mark Rocha, our chancellor. Though you're not here, thank you. Also, you might be noticing something different than some of our events. There's some cameras. There's some cameras here, some cameras there. Uh, so that is because we have our wonderful Broadcasting Electronic Media Arts Department here filming this. So one, if you love being on camera, great. And if you're in the audience and don't, well, stay away from up here. Uh, this will also be collected, and these will be on the Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation's YouTube channel, so people that weren't here can access this and really get a view of what we're doing. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for being here for that. And students uh, that are in the pitch competition, we also want to do some interviews of you around the experience afterwards, so please stay around for that. Now, to get moving forward... I am going to relinquish the microphone to Tom Bogle, who is our Vice Chancellor of Academic Affairs, to welcome us. Thank you so much for being here, Tom. Oh, thank, you. 
Thank you so much, Jonathan. I, um, you've stolen most of my thunder. I will be brief because you want to hear the pitches. You don't want to hear uh, you, you, um, from me. So uh, just on behalf of the Chancellor and the Board of Trustees, I want to thank you so much for, uh, for all the work that's gone into today. Uh, you know, Leo, Susan, Vivian, uh, the, the broadcast folks, Jonathan, uh, Zach, everybody. Um, it is such an important mission of the college to prepare our students for the working world and entrepreneurship and innovation is such an important part of that work. Many of our students, you know, will go on to employment in a traditional, uh, a traditional company, but we know that the fire burns within a lot of these students to start something new. Uh, and we know that is true across our curriculum. Uh, so uh, starting up this Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation and supporting it uh, is, is supporting our students. So thank you to everybody uh, who's involved with this. Thank you for our, our panel here today. Uh, and let's get on with the pitches. Thank you again, Tom. Uh, so at this point, we are going to transition into the competition, which is why we're all here. Uh, we have a wonderful host. Ian Utelli, who's going to be here kind of moderating this, helping move this along. He's going to explain the process in a little bit more detail, but I do want to say thank you. Aside from being one of our entrepreneurs in residence that helps to mentor and coach our students, he is a repeat volunteer at this event. So we just want to thank you for your time um, in helping our entrepreneurs realize their dreams. Thank you. Um, and last, there's, uh, you'll, you'll understand the dynamics of the competition in the moment, but when there is the, the opportunity for questions to be delivered, audience, if you have questions, our students would love them, but hold them until you can engage with them one-on-one, -on -one, because we want to make sure that the judges are having time to really get their questions answered. So please, hold on to your questions, because they can help our entrepreneurs grow, but ask them afterwards. All right. Thank you so much, and to hand it over to you. Happy Friday, everybody. Happy Friday. Well, today is going to be a good day. You all remember today. <clears throat> I mean, I remember a lot of things people say. There's 30 people pitching. It's a lot. It's a lot of people. Be, be very quick, though. And, um, but you remember how you feel, and you're going to feel people's nervousness, right? So remember, if you're in the audience, smile. Like, help everybody take the edge off. You know, for a lot of people, they haven't pitched in front of anybody. And the thing that I want you to know if you're pitching today is that everybody's on your side. Everybody wants you to do a good job. And if you fumble and you mess up and you get caught, that's okay. We're just having, we're, we're enjoying each other's uh, innovation today. That's what we're doing. So thank you so much for the panel of investors. Uh, I'm incredibly grateful that you're here to judge all of us. <laughs> and to my friends that are pitching as examples, uh, I asked a handful of my friends to come and pitch. They've already raised a lot of money. They're in the process of still raising and building an incredible companies. So I thought it'd be nice for the students to see an example of how different people pitch. And you'll notice all of us pitch quite a bit differently from one another. So let's get started. If you want to put a slide up, and uh, I will jump in. So I'm going to give an, the first example pitch, but I don't pitch a lot. <laughs> So uh, it's just my style. I don't, I don't have like the normal method that everybody follows. But this is my company called Attention Live. It's not really my company. I'm building it with partners, an incredible team. And so uh, this, what you see on the screen, are voice devices. And so you can go to the next slide. And I'm just going to walk you through basically one slide. I just want to explain what we're doing. I think it's very easy to understand what it is that we're trying to accomplish at Attention Live. Right now, there's a software and hardware problem. So if you want to live stream to social media sites like YouTube and Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, I have to use multiple phones with different LTE connections in order to live stream to these different places. How you doing out there? I'm loving you right now. That's a problem because people can't afford to have more than one phone or more than one phone line. Also, software is a problem. There's some softwares out there, but you have to be a specialist to use it. So we're trying to simplify the process of broadcasting content live through every single device. So through Attention Live software, you can go through this little process. You speak into a microphone or a cell phone or a tablet or a computer that goes into the cloud that then sends the content out to all the voice devices like Amazon Alexa, all the social media sites like YouTube, and then we'll send the archive out to the podcast platforms. 
So the problem that we're solving is that content creators need data ownership and multi-platform distribution. Next slide, Noah. And our solution is that very thing. We will provide data ownership for the content creator in a way nobody else ever has. We call it an attention and influence token, like a house has a deed or a car has a pink slip. When you stream content through us, you have proof of ownership and an automated way of monetizing it. Next slide. And finally, it's a decentralized platform, or at least semi-decentralized, uh, and so we believe that's the future of software. And the final slide. What you see up here is uh, the Twitter building on 9th and Market, where the Runway Innovation Hub is at, and I have uh, a great privilege of being able to work there, and then our headquarters are in Puerto Rico. Uh, and my team is the same team that I built my last software company with, uh, and all of us have exited that company, and so now we've all come back together to build the next thing. That is my presentation for Attention Live. So, I'm going to call up the next example entrepreneurs, and uh, why don't you come on up, Josh? It's my friend Josh Wilbur. He started a company called Steeped Coffee. And I love his company and his product. I'm drinking it right now. Here's the power. All right. Let's see if we get that up or not. But either way, hi. Um, all set? Cool. So I'm, uh, I'm with a company called Steeped Coffee. Um, we do, thank you. <laughs> Um, we do single serve coffee that combine, combines convenience, so think um, single serve coffee market and quality, um, third wave coffee, specialty coffee, stuff like that. Um, oh yeah, I really formatted these things. Awesome. Um, so it's served in a coffee bag, uh, so it's a lot more simple, a little bit different. So steeped coffee itself, we are a brand. Um, which we had to come into the market with just because it didn't exist so people could see how this whole thing worked. Uh, we're also a technology, uh, proprietary process, uh, a new brewing method, so kind of a mix between like a pour over a French press. Um, and we're also uh, a new method, you know, in general across the industry. So when people think of Steeped, it's not just a brand. It's not just licensing with us the technology uh, but it's also a brewing method, and they're all the same thing. So um, we're trying to leverage our, you know, um, trademarks and all of our brand as much as possible. So um, we are really focused on coffee without compromise. That goes across the board with everything that we do. Um, through we're a B certified corporation, um, do direct trade coffee, and a big thing is uh, all of our packaging is sustainable, and you know. Uh, compostable and all of these awesome things. So um, we have lots of logos. Um, with making steeped, um, it's, it's as simple as you put the bag in the cup, you pour water over it, you dip and dunk uh, like, a, like a French press, and then you let it steep for five minutes. And then you can leave it in. It doesn't get bitter like tea. It just keeps getting better. And then eventually, uh, you've just got a great cup of coffee, and, and it just keeps getting better as you go. So. Um, the single serve waste problems, it's a, a huge thing with, uh, you know, there's been enough pods since 2009 to wrap around the planet 130 times and they're all sitting in landfills and mucking up our whole, you know, waste system. Uh, so this is really a reaction and a solution towards that as well. So not just a way to empower the single serve coffee market, uh, I mean, the specialty coffee market, but also to, you know, redeem the single serve coffee market. Um, and the machines to make it are worse than the pods themselves because those are also not recyclable. So uh, all of our packaging is compostable and renewable. Uh, we just got an award last year at the SCA, um, especially coffee, uh, coffee Expo, for best new product in packaging. Uh, so we actually have a whole packaging arm around what we do now as well uh, to provide our compostable, sustainable packaging to other CPG companies around the planet. So uh, pretty exciting. Um, 
they say uh, the most complicated, I mean, the most simple ideas are the most complicated to achieve. Um, we put a lot of innovation and technology, uh, next slide, into, um, you know, what makes this product so simple uh, with ultrasonically sealed edges for maximum capacity, precision grinding, our full immersion filters, everything's nitrogen sealed so there's no oxygen in the pack. So when you open it up, you'll notice, everyone has one, uh, that it actually fills the room with that fresh ground coffee smell um, and a bunch of other things. And just in general, next slide. Uh, we have the steeped brand, which is really focused just on, you know, the basics, light, medium, dark, extra dark, and decaf. But then we also have, next slide, our licensed roaster program, which lets other roasters use our technology to put their coffee and their brand in the packs. And we've done, I think, over 100 uh, partnerships this last year with roasters from around the country. Uh, so the method's not just propagating through our own brand, but also through everybody else's who all these people have, you know, relationships with and trust in those brands. And, and we're really excited to see those things come out. So you'll actually see it around the whole country. Um, we also do private label stuff with businesses. Um, and next slide. And um, that's pretty much it. Uh, there's a lot of, we're doing well as a company. Uh, I think we grew 4x from last year. Um, we're going to do probably five next year. Uh, we're hiring like crazy. We're expanding. We're tripling capacity. Um, the team's really fun, but it's even getting better. We've got some really talented people coming on board next month as well. Um, so there's just, uh, I'll just kind of leave it at that. Is you know, it's been a really fun thing to be part of. Uh, it's fun to have an idea and be passionate about something. So I encourage all of you out there with whatever your passions are, uh, do it in a way that doesn't compromise. Um, you know, business isn't as an excuse to, to do, you know, bad things. <laughs> it's just like do things that you're proud of and, and you're, you're confident in. And that's what we've done with Steeped Coffee. Um, and it's just something that we're really proud of and that we stand behind. And uh, we hope you guys get a chance to try it out. And I think you'll see us around more often uh, as we, you know, are kind of getting everywhere that we possibly can. So um, thanks for listening. Thank you, Josh. Appreciate that. All right, we'll take the next victim, Kate Chernis from Lately. Kate probably has my favorite SaaS company in the world right now. So I'm excited for her to share what her and her incredible team have been working on. Keep stamping. Stamp, stamp. There it is. Her presentation's on fire. Hey, I'm Kate, co-founder and CEO of Lately, where we're taking a freaking flamethrower to social media writing as you know it. Because I used to own a marketing agency, remote, there we go. And that's me, by the way, overwhelmed by my own spreadsheets. And 10 years ago, I built Walmart, a spreadsheet system that got us 130% ROI year over year for three years. Fast forward to today, where Lately uses artificial intelligence to give customers like Mike, SAP, NBC, and others the power to do exactly what I did for Walmart way faster and way cheaper. And it works like this. So here's a blog by marketing mogul Gary V. And we're actually just going to um, copy the URL up at Gary V's blog, paste it into Lately's auto generator, type in a few hashtags, and then click this magical button here so Lately's artificial intelligence can get to work and in this case, create 17 social posts. So that now a social media manager can come in, look through, edit, schedule, publish, 90% of the work done in less than 10 seconds. And yeah, they're not all perfect, but the point is that Lately starts you at third base, making writing social media effortless and way, way more effective. But here's where it gets big, because then customers can syndicate the publication of those posts out to unlimited Lately accounts. So like Ben Your Media, for example, auto-generating and then publishing out to all 750 employee advocacy accounts. 
because even, whoops, there we go, which allows us to actually start small. <laughs> it's great. And target individuals that meet key qualifications. And then, next slide, uh, stretch up to much larger deals. So, for example, Dynasty TV landing in at $564 a year, expanding 25x up to $14,000 a year, and then stretching up even further to 100x from where we started. Next slide. Because even Gary V knows that the way to win is by creating 30 plus pieces of content and using AI to do it all at scale. Next slide. Which is why we use Lately to market Lately, right? So uh, as, as is the case with this blog from SAP, dog fooding our own product and boom, social media content mega factory. Next slide, please. The result is a 50% trial to sale conversion because the product sells itself. Because when people see it, they do what you did, which is nod their heads and think, well, obviously, this should exist in the world. So, next slide, please. And yeah, we know it's early, but we've got laser focus, product market fit, and now it's time to fuel that fire. Now it's time to grow, which is why we're here. Next slide, please. Looking ahead at our um, weekly metrics that we pay attention to, we focus on demo requests because we know we're going to close them at a rate of 50%. This lets us track our marketing to see how well we're driving those requests. It also lets us look at how we're able to fulfill those requests, which obviously, again, is why we're here. It's time to grow. Next slide, please. This one's always my favorite slide. Please meet Team Lately. Yes, they call me Kately. <laughs> Next slide. I'm Kately from Lately, where we make writing social media effortless and way more effective. Thank you. Good job, Noah. You know how that Justice, you're up. All right. Justice Earl, one of my favorite people in the world. We grew up together. And uh, I love all of his inventions, especially when he's about to tell you about called the snap ring. So as he gets ready, he just came back from Singapore where he dialed in the manufacturing. And uh, Justice, blow our mind, my friend. Tell us about the future. All right, are we ready? Well, now that Ian shared half of my presentation, um, <laughs> so when you think about movements that have radically changed how humans have interacted with technology, you think of PCs, you think of smartphones, you think of tablets, you think of pencil and paper, name a more iconic duo. But all of these movements have already happened. It's a rare moment in time when you get to be a part of the next big movement. And voice technology is an example of the next big movement that's happening right now. Voice-activated smart speakers are growing faster than Facebook and the iPad, Apple's fastest growing product ever. What are these being used for? So studies show that they're primarily being used for audio and video content, which is hardly revolutionary. So we ask the question, why? Why are people adopting this new technology? What could be possibly wrong with that perfectly rectangular device in your pocket that's a constant distraction machine that's continually sucking our souls into the vortex every single day? I think I've answered my own question. The answer is that voice makes these interactions frictionless. Now, the big five tech companies, they've already seen the writing on the wall for screen technology. They're already heavily invested in the next new interfaces. Today, we are introducing SnapRing. SnapRing is a frictionless interface for all of your media. 
Now, Nielsen reports that Americans listen to a staggering 4.5 hours of music a day. Additionally, we're uploading... This is a, a friction-full experience right here. We're uploading, uploading more video and photo content more than ever before, including new app platforms emerging every day like TikTok. So our, our ring operates every single, or not every single, it's quite a quote. Uh, we operate over a dozen of the world's most popular apps. So we control your music and audio content your video and your photo content, and your streaming content like Hulu, Amazon, Netflix, stuff like that. Um, I'm going to skip ahead. I had just, uh, as Ian mentioned, I just got back from Singapore on Monday um, where we officially started production with the manufacturing company who first made Fitbit, they scaled Fitbit from zero units to over three million units a year. Uh, we launched with a, a high-tech, uh, an exclusive retail in London called Smart Tech, which is inside Selfridges, voted the number one best department store in the world four years in a row. Now, previous to uh, SnapRing, back up here, previous to SnapRing, I worked in um, Silicon Valley at a, at a high-tech startup where we completely disrupted the solar industry by being the first to bring, among the first to bring uh, Internet of Things to solar. My business partner, Jason, was the first president of PopSockets, which last year was named the second fastest growing company in the United States. They sold over 100 million units. Um, we think that we can have a similar success and we're looking for the right partners to join this moment with us. Thank you. I love that new presentation so much. So much voice goodness in there, Justice. Yay. All right. Um, I look up to the three f folks that just presented. They've all built uh, really wonderful companies. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, but they look up to people like Dirk, and I am so very grateful, Dirk, that you came. Uh, Dirk is a legendary entrepreneur. He is uh, one of the mentors to the German Accelerator. I believe this is his fifth startup, uh, and he's the type of guy that uh, any entrepreneur would be grateful to learn from. So I suggest that all of you pay attention to everything that he does, the way he built his slides, uh, the way that he is going to speak about his company. And um, Dirk, thank you for being here to help all of us. Hello. Hello? Hello. Okay, hi. I'm Dirk. Um, who in the room knows the game Monopoly? Hands up, maybe? Okay, great. So you know what, we're, what I'm going to present to you today. So when I sit together with um, two of my friends here, we had a game night, and we were playing this famous game Monopoly, and we were watching Stranger Things, and we all tech people. We said, okay, how can you mix uh, actually two, three things, right? Uh, Stranger Things, Monopoly, and, uh, and blockchain. And that's um, how we came up with the following idea. So, next slide, please. <clears throat> so, if you look into blockchain, uh, anybody owns Bitcoin here or so? Blockchain? Who knows blockchain? Yeah, okay, some people. <laughs> okay. So, basically, but every, who knows Bitcoin? Heard about Bitcoin. Okay, good. So, this new uh, cryptocurrency. So, the basic idea is, um, you know, that you have a completely two new technology paradigm, but as all technology, it's super complicated and... Uh, as you can see here, you have to uh, deal with private keys, wallets, makes it really, really not a fun experience. So, um, so we came up with a new idea, which is the next slide, which is then what do we call um, a property trading game. And um, the basic idea is um, that we, next slide please, want to build um, a blockchain game that's really ready for mass adoption. And it works very simple as that. 
Um, you basically buy, trade, and you can also develop properties. And everything is based on real-world addresses. So you will be able to, and we actually launched in closed beta in San Francisco, you will be able to build um, a virtual property on 234 Post Street or something. You will be able to buy that property. And um, you can use fiat. Fiat is actually like dollars or euros, just a term. Uh, cryptocurrency or, or in-game currency called Apex in that game. <clears throat> And what you get is true ownership. You're going to own that piece of property. It's going to be yours. It's very unique. And it's going to be an open, decentralized economy, so you actually will be able to trade it again. You will be able to sell it again. In the beginning, against our in-game currency, which is called Apex, but in the future, also against dollars. So that's possible. You buy something with dollars, and you get it back for dollars, right? <clears throat> and we're going to hide all that complicated uh, blockchain stuff. Next slide, please. So the way it works is um, you actually use today no, still your mobile phone browser. Um, you see the map of San Francisco, and you actually can go and discover some properties. You zoom in. You see one property, like what you do in Google Maps, and you decide to buy it. Right now, this costs 1,000 apex, which would be equivalent of $1. So we sold for very much more money already some properties out there. Um, once you bought the property, you can start a collection, like very much like a monopoly. So let's say you collect three bars in San Francisco. Once you completed that collection, you're going to earn Apex, which is our in-game currency on it. And um, of course, you have to earn a lot to become some kind of a property mogul. Um, and what we're also going to introduce to drive more momentum into the game, uh, we'll have uh, uh, competitions and collaborations. It's going to be really lots of fun. So, next slide, please. Um, we have a closed beta, which we launched in June. It's huge. We have 25% conversion rate. So, I don't know if you know into gaming. Normally, you're speaking of 2 or 5% conversion rates. It's huge conversion. People really relate to the game. We sold over 1,000 properties. And we have a highly engaged and growing com um, community. Next, uh, next slide, please. So what's important, when you're an entrepreneur, you always have to see you know, that you cannot be copied very easily. And that is also called uh, unfair advantage you want to create. And that's what we are doing here. I've mentioned some of those. You know, we make it super easy to onboard. You just need an email, and you know, it's a very complicated process in the back end. But in the front end, for the user, it's simple. Very much like Google search, right? There's a lot of things going on at the back, but you know, using it is super, super easy. Um, also, what we also going to be unique or new is we're going to allow fiat, or so dollars or euros or whatever currency you have in and out. So we're going to be the first game allowing that. It's also kind of interesting. And also we have an artificial intelligence project, also how we're going to differentiate. So it's really hard for anybody else to copy how we're going to define the borders. Um, next slide. So we're going to market, as you can see here, um, through uh, three channels, basically. One is classical online advertising, performance marketing, Facebook, uh, and, and so on. Uh, the second one will have a lot of local activities. You can see the billboards. You probably see the llama, which I'm wearing also here, more soon, uh, soon more often in, the, uh, on, uh, in San Francisco. And last but not least, um, since I'm an entrepreneur, we want to establish a franchise system. So we want to create thousands, if not millions, of jobs where actually, because we don't want to sell, let's say, you know, right now in quotation marks, we are selling uh, San Francisco, but in the future, we will allow people also to sell Houston, Dallas, whatever, and I don't know those cities. We want local entrepreneurs selling those cities and making sure, you know, that this is a vibrant um, community in their, well, in their local area. Uh, next slide. So just a quick timeline. We raised um, a couple of million dollars so far. And um, we are going open better, which is very, quite important now um, in the next couple of days or maybe weeks. We have to see before or after Christmas. It's going to be very exciting. And then we have a mass market launch in the first half of next year. So that's the, right now we're better testing. We want to collect lots of feedback. Um, so this is the, the team. So I'm doing this. Uh, as you can hear my accent, I cannot hide it. I'm German, <laughs> but I've lived here in the Silicon Valley <laughs> since 10 years. And I'm doing this together with uh, my two co-founders from Israel. They're also living here in the Silicon Valley, also um, serial entrepreneurs. Um, together, we raised over $100 million uh, easily. <clears throat> so next slide, please. Um, so if you want to try it out, the game, unfortunately, we have also here some chips with some barcode on. If you can take a picture image here, you get actually uh, uh, 5,000 upwards equivalent of $5 for, for free, or you just go to the website and enter the access code so you can actually try out the early beta if you want to try to do it. 
So, um, yeah, so that's basically um, Upland, and maybe I see you in that new country. Thank you. Dirk, why llamas? Why did you guys choose llamas as the, uh, as the logo? We're wondering if you want to answer. Do you have an answer for the llama? I think you told me in Vegas. No, it's, it's, it's very simple because I think llama is a very, it's a very positive animal. People always associate it actually with, with its spits, but llamas never spit at humans, actually. That's actually just a, you know, whatever rumor. Normally, they spit at each other when they feel threatened by another llama, right? But as such, llamas are very intelligent people and um, actually, and I have to be a little bit also... Um, honest here when we saw because we had different animals we said we saw that we want to have a hero in our game and we're going to have actually also some villains you know like a shark it's all coming up but we said who's going to be the hero and we saw the different uh, uh, you know uh, uh, suggestions from our designer and we fall in love fell in love with that uh, llama so hopefully uh, our players and uplander how we call them are going to like them what's the tie-in with stranger things what was the tie-in with Stranger Things? Oh, that's a good point. Actually, I probably forgot. So, who has seen Stranger Things? Anybody here? Right, the series. So, actually, what's happening in there? You know, they have a parallel world, and what we are creating is basically also a parallel world because it's based on the real world address. But we're creating, like you've probably heard of Second Life and other things, you will be able to build a parallel world which is already out there today. And you've seen you know, the llama wearing virtual reality headsets, so all that's coming, you know, that's, you know, where people can create a completely new decentralized economy. We have designers who are going to sell designs in there, in this virtual world, and lots of things. But I, I don't want to overpromise, I have to deliver first. <laughs> All right, it's time to transition. We are now going to do the student pitches. And so for all the students, pay attention. Right now, here we are. I need your attention for this moment. When you're up here, you have a total of five minutes. Your pitch needs to be three minutes or less so that the panel of judges have a moment to ask some questions and interact with you. That will be one of the most helpful things for you as a team or an individual, as well as for everybody else to learn here. Okay, so again, there's five minutes on the clock. When that hits three minutes, it means you've burnt through two. I'm going to snap my fingers. And you have 10 seconds left. I'm going to snap my fingers again. You really need to wrap up at that point. Because if you go over, you're going to not have time to engage with the judges. And even worse, you might end up uh, impeding on the other pitches. We do not want that to happen. Uh, the reason why we didn't take questions from us that just pitched is that we were up against the clock, and I want to make sure I stay on schedule. But from here on out, uh, the judges will be interacting with you. So before we transition to the students, I'd like the judges to please introduce themselves, starting with Sandy Miller, the CEO of the Runway Innovation Hub, who I'm very thankful to be your friend and be able to work inside of your uh, Innovation Hub, your environment. Great. Thank you. Um, well, I'm really excited to be here today. This is my first time to City College. Um, I've worked with entrepreneurs developing some form of technology for a long time in fields like um, medical devices, uh, developing 3D printers for the International Space Station, um, even 3D printed meat and leather and some interesting things. So I really enjoy all sorts of technologies. And Runway is a co-working space and so we work with amazing tech startups as well as corporations who are trying to engage with tech startups for their innovation uh, pipeline because large companies really struggle to be innovative and entrepreneurial. So I, get to, I have an amazing job because I get to work at the interface of really cool startups and really cool companies that are trying to bring the latest and greatest to all of us. Um, so, it's a pleasure to be here today, and I look forward to seeing some great pitches. Awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is Anne Ahola Ward. I am best known around Silicon Valley as the mother of startups, which CNN called me in 2017. Um, I wrote a book, which the winners will be getting today, uh, about 
the topic of uh, SEO, which is what I specialize in. I help startups grow. I work with the hottest uh, emerging tech companies here in Silicon Valley. I have a lot of connections, and I uh, have basically done growth throughout my career. Started out as a developer, migrated into SEO as the field was forming through my love of analytics. Uh, I am Anbot at everything, A-N-N-E-B-O-T. Uh, you'll probably find me on Twitter, and I'm very excited to be here because I love startups. I love creating something out of nothing, and I feel like I'm looking at the future here today, and I can't wait to see it. Hi, my name is Lauren Taylor, and I have a marketing agency and brand consultancy for early stage startups called Zero Gravity Agency. I'm also an angel investor. We work with early stage startups, and we specialize in uh, really helping startups that are at that critical juncture where they're looking for uh, venture capital, but they need to get traction for their product, and they can't get traction for their product without capital. So we step in at that stage and are able to invest to get them that boost that they need in order to be more attractive uh, to continue to scale. So I'm really excited to be here today. This is my second time uh, participating in the pitch event, and we have some incredible uh, entrepreneurs here in this CCSF community. I'm so grateful to be able to spend time with you today. Thanks. Uh, my name is John Pimentel, and unlike my esteemed colleagues, I'm not a technologist. I can barely operate my email. Uh, just kidding. And uh, my specialty is working with uh, early stage companies and having co-founded multiple early stage companies in the sustainability and renewable energy field. So we have a distributed wind company. We have a utility scale solar uh, project developer. We have an on-site uh, wastewater treatment um, uh, and water recovery system, and in the past I've worked in the fields of ethanol, solid waste, and used motor oil recovery. Um, so my uh, my work is a little more, a uh, little less uh, digital and a little less uh, technical, but still important for the world. Uh, I'm excited to be here. This is the first time I've been to uh, CCSF, and I think it's uh, going to be a great day. Thank you. Hey, I'm Zante, and a little bit of background about myself is that while I was rowing competitively for the Pacific Rowing Club, uh, I was also a bike courier for Uber Eats and Postmates. And during that time, I developed an understanding of how the instant delivery market functions and an idea for how it could be done better. So essentially, we want to propose a positive change to the instant delivery market by providing an improved free market instant delivery system and essentially, we provide tools of empowerment to independent businesses and contractors uh, to provide, what is it, motivated entrepreneurs like you guys uh, to be able to start their own instant delivery operation for free with ease. Uh, the idea behind it is the value of free market uh, distribution versus corporate run distribution. I believe that free market distribution is inherently better at satisfying supply and demand uh, for all markets. And the implementation of this is four applications, one website, there's a business manager app which has a menu editor, um, the ability to hire couriers on the system within your locality. It has uh, a GPS uh, dispatcher control panel provisionally patented by us and also sales and business analytics. Uh, there's also a courier app which contains a routing GPS system uh, to complete the route. Uh, also a system allowing you to reach out to businesses operating in your locality through our system. And a consumer app, which allows you to buy from businesses within your locality. Uh, then there's a depot manager app, which allows uh, restaurants and depots to manage incoming orders effectively. And then there's a website, which combines the aspects of the business manager app and the consumer app together. Uh, our business model is that we take 5% commission on all instant delivery sales through our platform. Uh, what is it? 1% commission on all uh, over-the-counter sales, 2% commission on pickup sales. When you compare that to instant delivery businesses that exist today, they take about a 20 to 30% commission. And 
uh, usually there's an upfront cost. So uh, as this is an instant delivery system, we also deliver on the concept. We have a complete functioning prototype uh, built over the course of a year and a half that also serves as the, uh, the foundation for the entire platform. Um, we have a provisional utility patent on the GPS courier interface that you could actually see operating in the corner right there, um, and complete uh, drawings to map out the interface designs. Uh, this is the team. We're all CCSF students. Aside from myself, there's Julian Carrero, the interface graphic designer. He's actually right there taking pictures. Uh, then we have Jackson Prowell, who's our um, encryption web and server developer. Um, and then uh, the mentors who are not directly involved on the team uh, but provide valuable support. Uh, we have Jeff William Johnson. He's a senior MTS architect at PayPal with more than 20 years of experience. Um, he's helping me uh, allow my code to reach industry standard. We have my father, John Hayes. He is the founder of Wildbrain, which was once the biggest animation company in San Francisco. Uh, he's essentially allowing me to tackle unforeseen questions and you know, learn the skill of entrepreneurship. Our market plan is based off of free market principles. Essentially, you want to start with go local marketing, starting with home kitchens, which were just legalized this year in California. Um, you know, farmers markets, homegrown produce, but also uh, niche markets like you know, uh, electronic parts for engineers or bike parts or instant condoms, you know, anything like that. Uh, any questions? So I, th I think this is really interesting. I, um, when I think about sort of future of work, um, I, I think this is pretty intriguing um, because this is, you know, I like the free market um, angle that you're tapping into. And just to confirm, your, your customers are all of these businesses or the delivery people? Uh, well, essentially our target demographic is the businesses. That's how we get our revenue. But couriers are also served by our platform. Uh, and I guess so are consumers. But the main... Uh, no, your customer. Oh, our customer are the businesses, yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you so much. All right, we're ready Thank for you. the next presentation. Again, you did a great job. Thanks for starting out for the rest of the students. Thank you. Uh, very courageous of you to go first. I'll take the next person or team up right now. Uh, again, the clock starts at five minutes. We need you to end before it says two minutes on it so all the judges have enough time to ask you some questions. All right. We are ready for you. You're going to do great. Everybody can't wait to hear what you share. Hello, everybody. My name is Jared Arpa. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Common Grounds uh, Coffee Cup Advertising. And we believe we have the most effective form of marketing, of, of advertising in the marketplace today. Our Advertisements are viewed by our customers for up to 2,220 seconds on average. What kind of advertisements have that kind of uh, attention? Uh, simple. <laughs> Coffee cups. Essentially what we do, our business, is we put your brand in their hand. Um, so what goes into coffee cup advertising? Well, let's say there's an advertiser, small local business. Uh, like many one of you, uh, you presenting today, you pay us, and we put your brand um, onto the coffee cups and distribute th those co uh, blank coffee cups uh, to the many dozens of uh, local coffee companies located around the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, so, sorry about this. Um, thank you. So why would somebody want to advertise onto a coffee cup? Well, it takes the average person 30, up to 37 minutes to finish a cup of coffee. In that time, they'll be moving around like a walking billboard exposing that coffee cup to at least six different people before f consuming that, uh, that cup. Um, what's in it for our company? Well, we make up to 15 cents profit per every cup that we distribute. What's in, what's in it for the, the coffee stands? Well, um, 
They save up to $15,000 a year on inventory costs by, uh, by getting our free uh, coffee cups. And uh, I'm so sorry. Um, And, w w and uh, when people think of coffee, st coffee stands, they, they typically think of places like Starbucks, Pete's Coffee. Uh, but what are the other 25,000 other coffee companies in the country that uh, simply have the, the blank uh, coffee cups? Um, so we save them up to $15,000 a year by not buying the cups. And um, companies like this, ladies and gentlemen, people like this uh, saving, uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, people like this, these savings so much, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, approximately 80% of the coffee companies and stands that we canvassed throughout this semester have already signed exclusivity agreements uh, to work with our agency. Um, yeah, and uh, additionally, why we would like uh, you to invest your time into uh, furthering our, our company is, well, let me tell you a, a quick little story about uh, what went on to the process of developing this idea throughout the semester. Uh, for First few weeks, to be honest, me and my partner Clark uh, had trouble uh, coming up with an idea, so we met up at a SF State Cafe 101, and we decided that uh, there's a big opportunity in growing market and free ad space in blank coffee cups. We recognized the opportunity, and essentially what we wanted to provide was common ground between companies, brands, and their customers over a classic cup of Joe. Um, Essentially, what we're asking for today isn't an investment, but we would, we would like to further our uh, experience and knowledge and polishing our revenue model. Um, and uh, we've already established a fair good, good of rapport with Ian and Kate. Thank you for uh, coming to our class to present that, uh, that one week you, you guys did. Um, but today, um, just thank you for listening to my idea, and uh, thank you for your time. Um, great presentation. Um, I want to know why give away the cups? Why I mean, give them for free? Yeah, why not just heavily discount them or give them another incentive? Why, why give that away? Well, we figured that uh, when, we, when we did our uh, analysis, we figured that uh, um, the savings that these coffee stands would be uh, would be getting from getting free uh, free inventory from us um, is outweighed by the uh, potential profits from mass distribution. If we sign, uh, we figured if we sign, like past few months, we were able to contact 58 different uh, um, coffee stands around the San Francisco area, and we we actually uh, a lot we got we got 35 of them to agree uh, to use our our advertising strategy. And um, we figured that uh, if we were able to replicate that model, get at least 58 uh, coffee stands per month, we'd be up 700, up, up to about 700 coffee stands within the year. Um, or, and we'd be able to produce like, uh, um, a fair bit of profit that way. Um, we, we still need, we, we needed uh, assistance in in uh, polishing our revenue model, of course, but uh, we, 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 we believed in the idea and the, the opportunity behind uh, coffee cup advertising, and uh, essentially that's where we wanted to move forward from this class. I've got a question and a comment. This is a great idea. Sorry. Why isn't anybody else doing it? it seems pretty simple. <laughs> coffee cup advertising, I mean, it kind of spurred from the vision of creating a community canvas uh, or for companies and brands to, especially in the San Francisco area, we wanted to bring back coffee culture, like nice, you know, local, local brands, but we also wanted to provide assistance uh, for other local brands to uh, reach their target market. Everybody drinks coffee. Everybody's always looking at coffee. I mean, the, like I said, the average person t takes 37 minutes. They'll be looking at, looking, looking at the cup, drinking it, looking at the cup, drinking it at least 20 times before that cup is consumed. And there's a just big opportunity for free ad space. Thank you, Jared. Thank you very much, Steve. Ready for the next student or students? Uh, let me say this as Jared is uh, taking a seat. Jared might be the most charismatic, best talker in the entire class. And so you'll notice, like, it doesn't matter how charismatic or smooth somebody is. Like, it is hard to come up here and pitch. And so if you feel nervous, it's normal. 
It's totally okay. Uh, one thing is don't hesitate in wrapping up your presentation. You know, don't uh, feel the need to finish three minutes out because what you'll notice about with Jared is he did a great presentation, but also we could have asked more questions and that was when he was most comfortable, right? So as you come into your presentation, if you like feel like you're done in a minute and a half, two minutes, like just end and that gives us more time for more of us to ask questions, which will be feeling much more natural because you know that it's not all on you, but we're here to kind of help guide and learn about what you're doing. All right, are we ready for dollars and cents? Let's do it. Thank you, thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Liam Azule, um, and I'll be presenting an educational uh, uh, package or service that I'd like to uh, bring to the world, hopefully with some uh, guidance, mentorship, and some great feedback. So dollars and cents, two-pronged educational service or package bringing financial literacy and mindfulness to high school students. Maybe a little background on that. I'm a business administration student who's taken several finance classes here. And I also founded the Mindfulness Meditation uh, Club here on campus in fall 2017. So that's where the, the dual idea of, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, the idea of, uh, or where I noticed these two major factors lacking in students after high school and even adults. And I'll get into that in a second. The purpose, to prepare students with the tools and habits in regards to finance and mindfulness, preventing the derailment associated when lacking this foundational knowledge later in life. So whether it's um, business in the sense of high school students when they get their first cafe job and they don't know that 1040 easy form of writing exemptions or, um, or, or uh, uh, the realm of associated life with, um, well, let's move on, see if some things come to mind. Um, so what problem are we solving? Students are suffering exponentially from a lack of education in basic finance and meeting uh, stress. So this lack of education in finance is leading them to trouble later in life, whether it's not being able to save for retirement, not knowing what credit card APR is, um, as you can see with some of the stats uh, behind me. 43% of student loan borrowers are not making payments. Right after high school, you make one of the largest financial decisions of your life, um, whether it's with Sally Mae, and you end up in uh, six-figure debt situations. Um, so what is what would dollars and cents do? Dollars, and this is the, so dollars talking the financial aspects, cents talking about the more emotional and uh, feelings behind that in terms of mindfulness techniques. Um, so some stats in terms of uh, high school students with uh, depression from 2008 to 2017, rates of depression among kids ages to 14 to 17 increased by more than 60%. Um, another highlighted point, uh, the higher the suicidal behavior level, the lower the EI, emotional intelligence. Mindfulness techniques and mindful, mindfulness meditation is known to increase EI scores, so empathy, kindness and compassion, awareness of your own uh, sense of self. So what would dollars and cents do? Dollars and cents, we would train um, we would go to different school districts, which lowers uh, overhead of going into these institutions. We train staff. We bring this dual-pronged program, and uh, students are now graduating high school with those little classes that you wish you learned as you grew up. Oh, you know, when you're when you're applying for that mortgage, you're asking for that loan. Uh, these are things that you wish you would have learned. Um, it's scalable in the sense of. Um, doing these trainings and going to, um, across the country. It's scalable in the sense of customizing past high school students. I did high school students, as you can see, the numbers are behind it and the needs there. Even if you talk about certain apps like, oh, I'm going the wrong way. Um, certain apps like Calm and Headspace, you see that the demand's there. Um, and so as you can see, it's a curriculum, and even with the mindfulness idea, there's, I have a copywritten manual, a mindfulness attention-based program that uh, is protected, uh, that we could use specifically. If it's a nonprofit, that's when we would uh, use public schools, because only public schools only work with nonprofits here in the Bay Area. If it's a, I would like to make it a B Corp to where we could sell it. I mentioned the overhead and the scalability. Why now? talked about the market, $1 billion for mindfulness. Education we know is huge. 
Um, even if you're just talking about relevance, you guys, San Francisco is always ahead of things, but um, in, when you see all the yoga studios and this and that, in terms of just media, you can see how much mindfulness in, um, has grown. When we're talking about finance, you could see that only five states require financial literacy for high school students, which is huge. These are two major aspects that really uh, affect uh, life throughout, and I think uh, we should wrap it up. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Let's hear some questions. So um, I really like, I've seen other, you know, financial literacy programs, but I've never seen one that incorporates mindfulness as part of it, and that makes so much sense to me. So I think that's really interesting, and I think just one piece of advice is really to be thinking about how do you demonstrate the impact, you know, the benefits of mindfulness as part of the um, education and sort of ultimately the impact of the participants going through that. Um, but I really encourage you to continue pursuing the idea. It's That's really good. cool. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. We got it. Thank you. All right, we're ready for the next student or team that's pitching. I'm excited about these two coming up. This will be wonderful. So thank you for the two of you and all the students that have taken all this time to prepare. And all of us, we're cheering you on. I'm changing the clock over here to three minutes because everybody keeps going five. And you've got to stop at three. Otherwise, you won't have time. Yeah, you can have this one. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sandy. And my name is Oyuna. And if, uh, we are called Mind Tribe. But before we talk about Mind Tribe, I have a question for everybody. Have you ever felt lonely or depressed? And um, did you know that since 2017, the second leading cause of death was suicide among 14 to 24 years old? Uh, just a few days ago, um, Rome University in New Jersey reported that three students committed suicide in one single semester. And the school was criticized by not supporting uh, enough uh, resource to those who has mental health. And one student said, I never experienced suicide until my friend passed away. This is all I think about, and this is very personal to me. The school has 19,600 students with 15 counselors on hand, and that means only one counselor for 1,000 to 1,500 students. So our solution is to create a community app that promotes self-care and community care. And what do I mean by community care? It's basically just like self-care, but with the community aspect to it. So basically you will find activities, social activities to do with, your, with, with, with other people, and this will create real authentic communication and human interaction. Oops. So what's unique about Mind Tribe? So you guys heard about the Tamagotchi, right? And we're, well, we're trying to bring back the, the 90s and bring back the digital pet. And why are we bringing digital pet? It's because the digital pet represents ourselves. So it represents our emotions and our feelings. So when you're taking care of your pet, you're basically taking care of yourself. And what we're, tr what we're trying to also create is also teach students to learn to take care of, them, of themselves as well as others, and also involve their community. And uh, Mind Tribe will, the way we monetize our business model is to um, provide freemium services to many college students. Uh, they can use our subscription service to send, receive self care and pet care packages to their peers as low as $1.99 $1 per month. Uh, 
We will also allow third-party vendors access to our system to promote self and pet care services to college students. And um, our target audience would be college students between ages of 17 to 24 years old and to all gender types. And the way we're going to reach our target audience is through social media, through social organization, and classroom workshops. And whenever the students are, my tribe will be there. And we're looking for a potential investment of $100,000 to get um, started in, in this startup. And we're also looking for a potential co-founder in software development. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, great presentation, ladies. Um, I'm curious, who, if anyone, would you consider your competitors? Um, uh, we found a lot of, we try, I did a lot of research, and we had a hard time finding um, competitors that re involved community care. So I did a lot of research on just community care apps, and all I found was like healthcare, like um, for like um, for like doctors' appointment, things like that. But there's also been a, a talk around a smaller group where they're trying to bring community care. Like th this one article said that self-care is not enough. And it has to involve the commu community. It's like if you want to do yoga, like, do you, like I don't feel empowered to do it by myself. But I'd rather do it with the community. And I'd rather do it, be a part of it. And that's what we're trying to create. And we had a hard time finding competitors. But there's been a lot of talks about the community aspect. Um, and then lastly, just a quick comment. I would consider, I know that you want to target students, but I think the population that is the most isolated are seniors. And as the baby boomers are aging, they have got the most disposable income at their, in their reach, and they suffer from these problems. So I would consider expanding your age group uh, and doing some research on that because they have more money to... To yeah, deal with. <laughs> there is a way. There, the reason why we're focusing on college students is because seniors have a problem with technology, mm -hmm. and I worked at Kaiser, so I reset a lot of people of seniors' passwords, and they have a lot of issues with that because they get frustrated or the technology it's not, not um, it's not in their vocabulary, and so they get really frustrated when you come in into Kaiser, and so what I was thinking is that the students, college students, they're young, they know technology. They can go to, the, to help a senior and be able to help them with te te technology. I felt really bad for this um, senior woman who came in who didn't even know how to set Comcast. And I felt really bad for her. Like I was like, oh my god, like, you don't have family and friends to help you? She said, no, she lived by herself. So this is why I thought of the idea of having students, young, young generations, to help out the older generations because they need the most help with technology. So I, I just would really um, encourage you to, this is actually a really um, unreported problem. Um, the, the colleges, whether it's Stanford, name it, Absolutely. Um, to, you know, are, are really struggling with this issue. It is a huge, huge problem. And there are, the good news is that there are student entrepreneurs um, who are doing a variety of things um, because, you know, the system, if you will, is not meeting that need. So that means that you guys really are onto something big. And certainly it's, you know, it's an interesting, I think, doing an analysis between going after, you know, a mark, a specific target customer that, that might have more income versus what are other funding sources, um, because there are some that you guys could go after in this sort of model, if you will, outside the, the sort of university provided healthcare systems. Our end goal is to focus on everybody, but for now, because um, we just want to fo focus on the smaller group, and that, that way that in the future we can, we can expand and grow bigger. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right, we're ready for the next presentation. And I just want to I want to uh, say 
It was really fun to interview many of you last week. It's been, it's been great to see how you've developed your pitches over the course of the week since we spoke. And I'm excited for all of you to hear about this uh, product out. Uh, I'm excited about this specific uh, pitch. Go for it. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Isabel, and today I'm presenting out, which is a digital payment service. So having shared a same frustration with friends and coworkers, I came up with an idea of a faster and more convenient way of paying restaurant bills, particularly if within a group dining. So here are the problems I've identified. Bank of the West CEO Nandita Bakshi said that millennials are mostly unable to resist two things, which is convenience and doing things in groups. She said that dining out with friends is a social event they look forward to, even if their budget doesn't allow it, which personally is very true. Another problem is the uncertainty of payment method in group dining. And it can be time consuming for diners to wait for the bill to arrive and be brought back to the table. And that can also be overwhelming for restaurant servers as well during peak hours. And of course, our uh, dining expenses can easily get out of hand. So OUT aims to bring solution to all these problems. Here's the design I came up with for the app, which uh, where users have the ability to see the menu and prices for partnering restaurants. Users can pay the bill through the app with friends that they're dining with. Um, so it's easier for everyone to just select and pay their own meals. And also it shows the history of where you've dined at before and how much you spent. The target market for this are millennials, specifically those living in or around um, urban communities. Because the studies show that when it comes to dining out, priorities for those living in or around cities are healthy options, technology, and loyalty rewards in that respective order. So out will cater to these needs and the fact that millennials are smarter consumers today. According to the National Restaurant Association, in 2016, an estimated $783 billion were contributed in restaurant sales from millennials and baby boomers alone. But last year was the first time millennials surpassed boomers as the generation with the highest spending power. Now this app will be valuable to um, restaurant owners and servers because thanks to a faster, faster and easier checkout, there will be an increase in the amount of tables turned Paying digitally means safer work environment because there will be less cash at the cash register to be unaccounted for at the end of the day. And for diners, out will basically be your electronic wallet that will keep your cards, your points, your digital receipts, and that will allow for a more convenient way of keeping an eye on your dining expenses. I used a freemium model for this app, which basically means the app is free to everyone using a smartphone and then to those who would like extra convenience, they have the option to pay monthly for access to extra features. Um, commission on every transaction and digital credit cards are also some ways for the service to make money. Here are would-be competitors for out. Many of you might already be familiar with these. Um, Zelle, Square, who owns Cash App, which is like Venmo, and they're Splitwise. Um, an app that's also for sharing the bills and expenses with peers. The difference of Out from all these and many other apps or services out there is that Out will, users will be able to split the bill real time, no calculations needed, um, straight to the restaurant or potentially to other establishments. And what Out needs now is a team that would like to grow this into a company that I know will not only change dining experiences but other aspects of our daily lives for the better. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just really quickly, I wanted to ask if you have you considered um, not just using U.S. currency, but making it international or potentially using cryptocurrency? Because if if you were open to that, I think that'd be a huge opportunity. I've considered it. That's the potential of this app since um, we're using less cash nowadays. And I mean, we're still using plastic, the credit cards, debit cards, but specifically for group dining, I think that's a, 
that's the potential of it. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, we're ready for the next students. So I'm going to become a bit more serious about the timing. So at one minute, I'm going to say one in the microphone. And at three minutes, I'm actually just going to say thank you, and we're going to move on to questions. It's not because we have to ask, and student, come on up. Let's get started. It's not because we need to ask questions. I just have to make sure that we wrap up at 430 so that we can uh, honor John, who came to give us a keynote while we uh, decide who are the three winners of today. All right. We are ready for you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Marisa Feliciano Garcia. This is. Hi, I'm Shamel Birch. And we are Empowered Life Coaching. We are a vegan health coach and an image consultant who've come together to provide people with information about nutrition and style. The problem that we're facing is that people are generally sometimes unsatisfied with their image and are also misinformed about nutrition. Our solution is that we offer style and nutrition coaching services in literature. My service is that I offer one-on-one -on -one vegan nutrition coaching, teaching people what I've learned about how to transition to a vegan diet. Charmel specializes in body and color analysis and consulting, which includes a custom guidebook color palette and makeup products. One of our products is a magazine which includes style advice and easy vegan recipes for $7. Our website will have the ebook for sale for $5. We will also conduct group workshops. We charge $60 an hour for our one-on-one -on -one coaching services. Why now? Veganism has increased 600% from 2014 to 2017. And Shay's why now is that 80% of women and 34% of men struggle with their body image and experience depression, anxiety, anger, and self-loathing from unrealistic influences from the media. The self-help industry will be worth $13 billion by 2022, and the image consulting field is growing, and the beauty industry is a multi-million dollar industry. Our customers are women and businesses who are interested in eating healthier and improving their appearance, confidence, and self-esteem. We will reach them through our Instagram, website, Facebook, and word of mouth. We found people would be willing to pay $5 to $20 for a magazine, and we intend to publish a magazine monthly. Our competition are vegan coaches, vegan cookbook authors, and image consultants, but we are a more holistic approach. Our traction is that we've styled and coached over 40 people. We've had investor interest. We've printed the first magazine, and our Instagram is up and running. Our expenses will mostly be printing and shipping the magazine, and we would like to allocate a lot of money for advertising and marketing. Our background and history is that I've been vegan off and on for five years. I've worked in the food industry for seven, coaching for two, and have a degree in philosophy. Shay has trained as an image consultant at City College of San Francisco and has done cosmetology for 10 years. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We have some samples for you okay. guys. Great. So great presentation. Thank you. My, my big question is why a magazine? Why not digital? Yeah, um, it'll probably be mostly digital. Okay. And we also um, do the one-on-one -on -one coaching. So we have our services, which is the coaching, and then the product, which is like an e-book. Yeah, and that's going to be more scalable, right? That's going to be higher. I mean, it's great to have both sources of revenue, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but you guys, you know, to, to sort of scale your revenue and have that growth and get more people right. sort of into your content, digital is going to be less expensive. Right. 
Um, have you considered doing like corporate partnerships or you know coming into startups and helping them? They need a lot of help. Definitely, <laughs> like we could do workshops with multiple people within a company if that company wants to become better, they want their employees to become better, they can have us come in and do a little session with them. Master classes, um, also um, doing master classes for, for the digital world, um, on vegan and image. So. Very cool. What has your engagement looked like on Instagram so far? It's pretty small. We just started it. Started. Yeah. Okay, and um, do you have any goals around you know using Instagram to gauge audience interest or be able to really um, zero in on your niche or um, uh, kind of grow a, a community that then could um, become uh, loyal followers or consumers in some other way? Yes. Yes. Um, so we have taken this into classes and, and taken certain classes in order to turn our content into or our followers into buyers. So that is one ask that we actually need support in with because it takes the time to figure that out. So that is one ask to have the support into turning mm -hmm. our product into branding and content into buyers. Yes. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we are ready for our next pitch as the, here we are, we're ready to go. We're ready. Looking sharp. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's do it. I'm excited to hear about, about what you're working on. All right, so how many of you think that we're doing an amazing job fighting homelessness? Show of hands. Nobody, kind of what I expected. So I couldn't agree more. Uh, whoop. Right now, our solutions to homelessness are very reactive, and they really haven't changed much in hundreds of years. So my project is about bringing innovation to social services. My background is in psychology and human-centered design, and uh, down a little bit, oh. up for backwards, back, backwards, there we go. Uh, and over the past 10 years working in the corporate world, I've seen the potential of using human-centered design paired with things like predictive analytics, lean startup, and cross-functional teams. So with all these advances in the corporate world, question marks, hello, scroll up. Scroll up. hello, scroll up. there we go, uh, question, that's okay, question marks, question marks are up there. Um, so. <laughs> With all this advancement in the corporate world, why is the nonprofit world having such a hard time trying new things? Uh, so now if we can move to the process slide. Yes. So in the corporate world, we get money at the beginning of a project before we know what the solution is. And we go through the human-centered design process to research, prototype, design, test that idea. And by the time we get to a new idea, it's not scary. It's a safe bet because we've done our homework and we have data to show that it's a good idea. Next slide. But in the nonprofit world, uh, the best way to get a grant for next year is to repeat the grant you got this year. But this year, you repeated the grant that you got the year before. And so everything is rooted in the past and duplication rather than in trying new things. Uh, next slide. So this, this gap is what I'm trying to address with flight plan. Next slide. Great. Next slide. So benefits of working with flight plan. Uh, your, your staff at your nonprofit would gain new tools and experience, uh, such as human-centered design. Uh, you'd have stronger ideas, better data to back up those ideas, more grant money because you have stronger proposals, and more community buy-in because human-centered design is by nature a collaborative process that involves the community. Uh, my customers, I would get through uh, free webinars that um, lead to one-on-one -on -one consultations with executive directors. Next slide. And why now? So in 2019, homelessness spiked more than it has in the past 15 years. Uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development has given $75 million in grants to work on youth homelessness. And when you work on youth homelessness, you learn that 46% of homeless youth identify as LGBT. So this is my target population. 
uh, there is a little bit of competition in this space. These are organizations that bring human-centered design to the nonprofit world, but their focus is very broad, in some cases international, and my focus is, uh, again, on preventing LGBT youth homelessness. You're doing a great job, by the way. Um, so this is who I need help from. Um, if you're one of these people, I would love to hear from you as I grow this project. Um, you can get in touch with me uh, with this contact info. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. That was uh, a wonderful presentation. And as uh, the audience will notice, there's a lot of noble pursuits here. So really, uh, I honor all of you students who are really uh, going after doing something that's actually noble and good for humanity. Thank you for that. Anybody have a question for Andy? Does the idea, has the idea progressed to specific policy concepts or programs that you'd want to implement to address this homeless population? Uh, not yet. So human-centered design doesn't begin with a solution in mind. It begins with a question like that, and then I would get the right people in the room to develop a solution that answers that question. So um, that's why one of my asks is to meet with the foundation so I can learn how we can start to have that conversation about policy. Mm -hmm. Great. We have time for one more question if anybody has one. Sure. So. Um, I have to be honest, I'm not 100% understanding how you're attacking these problems. I, I, I think it's amazing that you're trying, but could you kind of give us a little bit of, you know, the nitty gritty on the, on the tech side? Uh, when you say tech side, there really isn't a lot of tech in this idea, I guess unless you'd go with the predictive analytics. So we can mine data and see where the amount, of the the most concentrations of hate speech is in the country by mining things like Twitter data. This is not a new idea, this already exists. It's called the um, heat map of hate. Um, it already exists and you can use that to, to do things like um, comparing school districts. So you could do some coaching around bullying and hate speech to say like your school district is not performing as well as your neighboring school districts based on the amount of hate speech that we're seeing online and your, among your kids. So what can we do to you know, raise the bar here create a safer learning environment. Just one example off the top of my head, but like I said earlier, I would start with a question, not, not a solution off the top of my head. Awesome. Thank you, Andy. All right, we're ready for the next student. Come on up. Um, if you are here and you are not pitching, but you came to watch or support somebody, can you please stand up? If you are here and you are not pitching and you came to support the students, can you please stand up? Everybody pitching, I encourage you to clap for these people like you really mean it. Because <laughs> if it's not for the support of our family, our friends, and our community, it's all that much more difficult to do the impossible, which is what it is to be an entrepreneur and start something that does not exist. Take it away. Hi, my name is Darcy, and I'm an independent artist. I've been tattooing since 2017. I'm also an oil painter. Um, and it can be a challenge to survive as an independent artist, to promote your work, connect with clients, sell your merchandise. So I'm going to let Rodrigo take it off. More than 90% of the ind independent artists today are struggling to survive. You know, such a, uh, such a talented person like Darcy or just a musician like me, I really have time, uh, I really have a hard time to make money and we always need a second job. That's why I have created Lemonies. Hello everyone, my name is Frederico Coltrin. I'm the CEO and founder of Lemonies. Lemonies is the social media platform for independent artists and then one stop shopping for fans. My vision that one day artists will survive doing their arts full time without need to go out and uh, you know, bartender or wait tables or be a nanny or drive. My mission is to empower independent artists and inspire fans to so socialize and do business. The problems that, I, that, that we face, you know, so that independent artists are struggling to survive, as I mentioned before, you know, most of them have to do a second job in order to keep their arts you know, alive. And the second problem that I see is that too many places for them to go. Today we have uh, uh, Instagram, we have uh, Facebook, we have YouTube. 
we have uh, uh, Spotify, all the social media platforms where they have to go. And it's really hard to manage all the platforms together. That's why you know, we, we see you know, uh, platforms like yours you know, that are, people can just write something and send messages all over, which is great. So the solution that we have, that I have created this platform where everything will be together in one platform. You know, the, the independent artists will go there, create their page, and they will be able to promote their arts. They will be able to add videos, accept donations, add music, and sell merchandise, engage with fans, sell tickets, and add photos in just one place. So they will not need to go in the different platforms, so they won't be uh, wasting a lot of time. The market today, you know, according to Estatista, today the market, it's a $20.7 billion. And uh, they're saying that by 2023, this is going to be $22.74 billion. And why now? I think right now is the best time. In the last few years, you know, we have seen uh, social media platforms coming up and uh, struggling with the law, we're struggling to put things together. And I think it's about time for us to have one place where we are going to be uh, being more profitable. So our competitors, I kind of like to call them worthy rivals, you know, because I see them as my inspiration. And of course, you no, know, my competitors will be Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Amazon, Twitter. Our finance right now, so we have spent, you know, something around seventy thousand dollars building a website. We build a mobile application for uh, Apple and for Android. We have spent also money with lawyers. And we don't have made any money yet. We just finished the, the website and the mobile application. We just sent it to Apple and we just sent to Google. So we're waiting for them to approve. And uh, so it's, the website is on a better version. We're just doing a lot of tests, you know, getting some feedbacks you know, on, on the website so we can apply for the, for the mobile application. The team is just me uh, and four more people. I have a web designer. Already? We have a web designer and four more people. My target is the independent artists, and uh, let's go for the questions. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right. Um, who would be your potential partners? Because if you're offering the support, which I think is great, artists need help to monetize. Mm -hmm. Um, how is that support being provided by virtue of them just all being in the same place or are you going to secure partnerships to help them sell their art or to what extent are you going to solve this problem for them? Well, yeah, that's my mission, to empower them. So our, our platform, we have created some functionalities that are instead, you know, let's say a, a band, you know, instead for them to have their music on Spotify and then have their videos on YouTube or have them their photos on Instagram, or selling tickets on Eventbrite or any other platform, they're going to be all together. And our team is small right now, but we are hoping to grow one day and have an intern team that can support them. But a little, you know, we go one by one, step by step, you know, helping each other. I've been a musician for years. I know there's a, a need for that. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Right. Thank you. We are ready for the next pitch. Ready for you. Go ahead. Hi, guys. I'm Sukant, and with Pian Pian, who's sitting right there, uh, we bring to you emotions. Um, second. Uh, in one sentence, uh, we can describe this as we're trying to use artificial intelligence. Uh, sorry. <laughs> This is really, really sensitive. Uh, we're trying to use artificial intelligence to improve your emotional intelligence uh, so that you can master your emotions. Uh, the problem we're trying to address here is can be split into these three categories. Uh, stress at a personal and professional level, especially as someone rises up in leadership levels. Um, inability to cope with emotionally charged situations and conflicts at workplaces and even in personal, in personal levels. Um, when they don't have their emotions handled, there's an inclination to blame others. Um, we've seen this all the time in Facebook or Instagram where you know, people blame each other, uh, refusing to listen to other people's opinions, uh, and a lack of empathy in general. Uh, 
there's examples from my own career. Um, I worked in the industry for around eight years, and I've uh, everybody wants to grow up in in their career, right? But there's repercussions to this. Uh, as you grow up, you might be super talented in your areas, but if your emotional intelligence is not handled, you can't really cope with those pressures as well. And that is a part we're, that's really missing, I think. It affects working professionals and their relationships with coworkers and other people. So, oh, sorry. Emotional intelligence can be defined as the ability to understand, manage your emotions, uh, to relieve stress, communicate effectively, empathize with others, and overcome conflicts in general. How we are um, envisioning the solution here is to start off with a mobile app, which will have AI inbuilt in it. We're going to collect data in a bunch of different ways, uh, starting with a questionnaire and getting your initial goals of what you want handled. And after that's after we get that, we're going to collect a bunch of different kinds of emotion data, which will be your heart rate in different situations, uh, your voice quality, or like your voice to vocal tonality in different situations, how your facial expressions change throughout, like through like in meetings or with in stressful situations, and AI will use this and generate a plan for you and recommend things for you to do. For instance, say speak in public. Uh, this week or go in a meeting and speak up higher so your voice is heard and people take you seriously and we're coming up with these different ways how to like strategize this but that is the general idea and this will gather trends over time and thank you. we're, we're gonna oh, we're gonna transition sorry. now thank uh, you so much thank you so from what we did here any questions about How do you make money? Uh, so we are trying to uh, market this as a product to businesses, so they can sell it, so they can their employees can use it. That is one way of we are trying to make money. We can sell it as a package, which can be used over the year. And also, we are also thinking the B two C route, but I think that'll be harder to make money. Uh, that, that's why we are thinking of going the business route. And what's the call to action for the panel investors? Are you raising money? Are you looking for we are, mentorship? Like, helps understand. We are we currently go. looking for mentorship, and we're looking for direction to make this um, where we can actually make money off this, and not just a cool idea where we spend money in development in AI. Right. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, and money too. If you, yeah. if someone feels generous. Good. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, we're ready for the next students. All right, Green Monkey, here we go. Looks like you might need more than one microphone. If you do, you can grab mine. Hello, my name is Matthew. My name is Ron. My name is Tamika here. I'm Jay. When taking a photo, a satellite photo of an image in, of a city, you see there is a um, gray bland area, and it's a major spot of a gray bland area. That gray bland area represents no, 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 no like no plant life. Sorry. Um, what I would like to do is I'm hoping to integrate nature back into these cities by creating and planting nature instead of artificial life and in the meantime being conscious of my carbon footprint. So introducing Green Monkey, we're a web, web and a mobile application. Uh, we operate as non-profit, a profit hoping to uh, um, connect homeowners and gardeners together where we'll offer rooftop gardens for completely free. And it's paid for, uh, paid by by the the city's green incentive grants and by a, a, a monthly maintenance fee. And because all our plants that we plant are native plants, the the natural dew of SF will actually take care of the plants. So the homeowners don't really need to maintain them or water them much. And so uh, this is how our app works. So first you pick your location, then you select the service you need. And then we'll, you're automatically connected to a gardener. And it's that simple on how you get a rooftop garden. 
And so along with our service comes a custom hardware where we monitor your soils, oxygen, and nitrogen levels. And it, we also uh, track how the plants are doing. So we'll automatically send a gardener if anything's wrong, and we'll do all the maintenance for you. Oh, we do the installation, provide maintenance, which is $150 per 100 square feet. And also on top of that, we provide custom plants and exterior design. So currently there's over 2.4 million uh, people living in Philadelphia and SF. Those are locations that has the Green Incentive Grant. And, uh, and there's over 680,000 homes that could be serviced with uh, um, a rooftop garden. They have strong enough infrastructure on their rooftop that, so that we can immediately put a, a rooftop on top. But there's only, uh, there's only 300 uh, rooftop gardens currently. So we hope that Green Monkey will be able to make the 300 approach the 680,000 homes. Um, we want to be uh, a social media presence on YouTube, Instagram, Yelp, um, send direct mail out to homeowners, landlords, business owners, owners, and be a part of a community events. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm really interested in um, better understanding how um, you go from uh, people just saying, yes, I want a rooftop garden, to them being um, uh, approved by the city to uh, receive these funds. And why wouldn't everybody line up to receive these funds? Then how do you prioritize amongst the people who have um, applied? I'll, I'll take that question. Um, how, how it works is they'll go on the app and we'll send a representative to the homeowners to file, fill out the pipe paperwork and we'll do the checks to see if it's, they can actually install a garden. And they won't be receiving the grant. It is the company who builds it. So any gardeners who do the rooftop garden, whether it's Lowe's or Prestigio Gardens, they're the ones who receive it. So then we're the one. And yeah, I don't know why not everybody's doing it. Yeah. Well, that was a good presentation. I. I do think that there's some unique opportunities with, with what you have uh, in front of you. And w what you mentioned, it, it, does, it does seem as though you could develop a system to help people and help them kind of get categorized in terms of how they can take advantage of these different grants. And it's, again, another noble project. So thank you so much. We're thank ready you. for the next student. All right, next student, come on up. Are you on the we have another team. Your team. And so why don't you come up, grab that microphone on that podium right there, and you can take the microphone in my hand as well. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Alfredo. Hi, I'm Maria Luisa and Mayela Hauri. And together we're working on a project. This is uh, pretty much what we call Amadeum uh, 2.0. Uh, we had the opportunity to present uh, last year. So now that's uh, improved. Um, go to the next one. We have Balance Hubs, which is us. OK. Um, the idea of this whole project is very simple. As you can see, um, in the Bay Area, there are people that are overworked, underemployed. They had to have two jobs. And you can see around here, there are a lot of homeless uh, students who work uh, living in, in trucks. And we're going to be addressing that issue uh, in uh, social work. This is basically a vision of having building a community where you can come work with us and live on the property itself. Uh, that's what encompasses Amadeum. A key feature part of it is the Balance Wellness Hubs, which will be a spa on the property itself. And that'll basically bring what Napa is very well known for, which is its relaxation and uh, escape the city and all the issues that we have. Uh, we have this common misconception that healthy is for the wealthy. And we have examples like whole paychecks and uh, you go to wine tasting and you spend a lot of money and they charge you for 
a lot in everything that you come across in Napa Valley. So we're trying to kind of we're trying to create a more accessible, financially accessible accommodations and vineyard, the wellness centers, and shopping. Okay, uh, the way we're uh, we're gonna approach this is in many places. Uh, if you go to a hotel, you have to check in at a given hour, uh, three o'clock. Uh, leave at 11 or 12. So you pretty much what you're going to be doing is uh, paying for 24 hour service and start counting from the moment you check in. Um, the other thing is um, if you don't use some of the uh, hours, then it can be um, counted towards uh, the next visit uh, that you have on the property. Um, now the, uh, the most important part is this is going to be and a joint effort by students and people that want to work together, live together. So we're going to have up to 40% uh, profit uh, sharing um, for the week, uh, uh, week work, 30-day uh, vacation time. It's pretty much based on the European style or some of the northern uh, uh, sections there. Um, some of the key features, and which we'll also be known for, not only working with the community, Ten but seconds left. is uh, offering special things like foodie facials, and in that, getting partnerships with our agricultural sectors and farmers to actually make product, uh, to make services and products. We're going towards everybody who can. Our revenue, it's a growing market in Napa. Uh, we want to expand the third largest growing sector, as you can see up there. Our competitor is either a super expensive, high-end place, or typical holiday inns and regular pools, no hot, no scrums, right. no nothing. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> For those that were here last year, you know that we got to hear about this um, at the last pitch night. So it's nice to see you continue to develop it. Uh, great job. And I know there's a lot of information packed into that presentation. So any questions from our panel? Hi, Hi. Um, great job on the presentation. I was wondering who are your competitors here? Because it seems like, you know, are you going for older people? Or are you going for working age people? All of the above? I'm just sort of curious. So it would be all of the above. Um, the ones that are known for creating a, you know, a relationship between nature and people is Bardosa. And that was a $70 million investment. And then aside from that, you just have resorts. And uh, those are very expensive as well, but there's a common misconception that, oh, those are for vacationers. The workers of the region will not go there. Uh, people who are you know, deciding when to go on vacation, they're not gonna go and pay hundreds of dollars for a simple mud bath or something. But if you cut down costs by just keeping it rustic and simple, you will motivate them to go. My friends and I are examples of that. We will take luxury. We will take accessibility to spa and other services over luxuries. Yeah. Vacations being out, not yeah. so anything. pretty much is for families and that want to spend the time together. So there's not going to be any type of technology, no TVs. Uh, the the phones don't work in that area, so it's on purpose. So it's families don't have time to spend uh, quality time together. So that's uh, the, the the market we're going after. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we are ready for the next presentation. You can grab that microphone right there on the podium. Hi, my name is Haik Makarian. I am uh, from Armenia, and uh, I am food technologist. And uh, I would like to talk about um, uh, food technology uh, and um, and th this company I would like to establish and it is it, it, it will we use uh, new emergency technology uh, uh, electro fermentation uh, so the the mission and the purpose of our company it's a natural healthy food for our healthy future I think uh, f uh, food, it is the, the core of the uh, health and it, it is the most important um, 
uh, uh, breakstone in our uh, health, and uh, we should make so much attention to uh, about uh, f food, what we eating, and. Um, I would like to talk about uh, technology and about my background also. I, I, I have a chance to uh, make internship in Food Technology German Institute. I studied this technology and I would like to uh, implement this technology in San Francisco. This is mostly new technology and uh, it's about implementation uh, electroporation. Uh, the plant will be look like this. Uh, it's like design. This is processing area and um, also food storage will be. And this is the equipment which is uh, 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 provide electric uh, fields. And this is the products what I supposed to produce. This is most small scale products. And uh, um, I would like to use this technology. And um, so about this technology, this is. Um, uh, parsed electric field processing uh, technique using two short high voltage passes and de destroyed the uh, cell membrane in different um, potentials and uh, this is very good effect uh, of uh, destroying pathogens and this is uh, technology it's about already uh, 13 years science uh, studying and it is like uh, it will be subsidized the he heating uh, pasteurization it's called cold pasteurization technology 20 seconds left and uh, this is about the problem uh, the reason uh, and um, the, um, the main problem with supposed to solve this technology and uh, because like uh, uh, right now uh, um, food uh, food industry is growing and uh, recently uh, uh, I found that uh, this market it will grow in 2022 about 26 uh, percent and um, uh, this is mostly European technology uh, only um, few companies uh, in America existed uh, this is like uh, oh, only the market uh, uh, players in this uh, Thank you. Uh, we're going to transition now. Thank you so much. All right. Any questions? Yes. Please, John. There's a microphone right here. Who is your customer? The food processor? I suppose the customer will be grocery stores it's, uh, or cafeterias and uh, using this technology, this equipment, processing, pasteurizing, and I can produce juices, I can produce like uh, even solid uh, products like chips, dry fruits, and this is uh, killing the pathogens. It's a huge issue, and in fact, it's a, we work with a lot of companies that try and tr retreat and reuse their water in the Salinas Valley and the Central Valley, so I think you have a big market to work with here. If you can focus on getting uh, a, a test customer with a good brand, I think you could spread the technology. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, we're ready for the next students. Thank you. Thank you. Who recognized what I just did? Uh, can I do it again? Did anyone see what I did? Uh, that was that was the reason why I'm here. So I'm here because uh, not a lot of people know about sign language, and I just discovered that sign language was important to my life not long not long time long time ago. It was when I discovered that my brother was growing. And suddenly, uh, something was changing. He was growing. I didn't know how to communicate with him. And that just made me realize how important sign language it is for my life and for a lot of people worldwide. Uh, how do I use this? So, Baiba is a social enterprise. The main focus is to uh, improve education worldwide. What is the social problem? As I said, out of 466 deaf people in the world, only 70 million speak sign language as a mother language. And, uh, well, the most important thing is that 80% of the deaf children 
it's not receiving any kind of education at all. So how is Baba gonna attack this? Solution, uh, there are some companies, well, let me go back, sorry, don't wanna. So there are some companies that are already trying to solve this problem and there are 10 companies. Uh, the problem is that they're having troubles with the technology. So uh, they have tri troubles with the technology and it's, become, it's becoming longer and longer to fix the problem. But we found out that we can, we can kind of try to solve the problem uh, without waiting for technology. So Baiba will make that we make, we'll make the language of the deck community a profit business. How is it gonna do it? Uh, we will develop our own brand based in established, high quality, comfortable clothes. Um, I know this doesn't sound, you know, how is this gonna help, right? But we don't know that actually we consume a lot of things unconsciously. We consume our cell phones, uh, we get into Facebook and then we see an ad because of Facebook, but we're actually using Facebook, right? So what we're trying to do is uh, also buy by investments and donations to support education. Uh, yeah, we don't have any money right now, but we're gonna grow money and then donate 40% of our, of our profit to build schools in third world countries. And also uh, we're planning to invest a 10% in other uh, technologies that actually need funding in order to create these sign language technologies. 20 seconds left. 80% uh, of Americans expect companies to do more than just profit. 80% of Americans will purchase a product because a company advocates for an issue they care about. Our main target market, 250 to 500 ASL speakers in the US. Uh, it's a short market, but we're actually targeting different markets. We're also targeting uh, sports teams, sports youth for youth, and that's because we believe that youth Okay, thank you. We're, we're going to transition now. Anybody have a question for? Um, this is a really, um, you've definitely made me aware of a problem I did not know existed, so thank you for that. Um, and I think you have a lot of compassion, and she's awesome. But have you, um, have you thought about how, the what's the monetization model here? So we're going to have high quality products. Uh, the problem is that these companies that are already in the market selling sign language, they're selling sign language in a wrong way. So they're actually selling it. Uh, they have these all sign language styles in front of the, the, the sweaters or anything, and they're selling a high price for it, like $60. I love sign language. I love my brother, but I'd rather buy a Nike shirt than buy, uh, you know, sign language, I know I like it. But the thing is that um, that people certainly, uh, they prefer quality. And I actually did a survey uh, for students where I got 66 uh, replies. And 51% uh, of these students, uh, they, they prefer comfort, quality, comfort, cost. So, um, this is a unique product, uh, also for sports teams, and that's because they're not getting high quality products and paying a lot of money. Parents are paying a lot of money. I know this because my brother uh, is in a sports teams, and um, by having a small detail of sign language in their shirts, not a big one in front of, so that's not the main detail. We don't. We want to sell. Thank you very much. Sign language unconsciously. Okay. Thank you, thank you for your presentation. We're ready for the next student. Useful reality is up. We're ready for you. Hi, we are Useful Reality. I'm Hallie McConlog. I'm the co-founder with Mike Mears. And uh, our mission is in everything we do, we set you free. We free your hands from the mouse and your eyes from the screen so that you can move freely and work with people eye to eye. We make software for augmented, uh, augmented reality glasses 
and our goal is to make reality useful. Here's a little example from um, Microsoft's HoloLens. Can you press play on that? So there are a lot of um, augmented reality vendors. I think I saw some glasses right here, as a matter of fact. What's, what's this brand here? The Snapchat spectacles, for example. This is going to explode in the next couple of years. But this uh, video, did we, or was it able to play? It's not playing. But the idea is you can move around the world, all around you, and just interface with reality wherever you are. You're not stuck at a desk anymore. You're not stuck looking at a screen. You're not stuck with stuff in your hand. Anyway, so the problem is we're all alone, tied down, imprisoned by non-ergonomic mice and screens. Useful reality frees you to click or type anywhere that is comfortable. Useful reality frees you. Uh, our competitors do not have 25 years of 3D interface experience in research labs that invented spatial interface. We do. I've been doing this since 94. So right now is a great time to start developing these applications and investing in these software companies because Apple and Facebook will be releasing their AR glasses in the next couple of years. So um, the augmented reality market is going to be huge. Right now it's about $50 billion with a 40 to 80% projected growth rate. In 2025, the market will be about... 149 billion. 30 seconds left. We have two augmented reality applications ready to roll out right now. We've done three years of user testing with a very diverse group of market. Uh, we're hoping for a 97% gross profit margin and about 4.3 million after the third year. Our team is me and my Dear legal consult, Mike Mears, stand up for a sec. There he is. And next, we make reality useful. Join us there, useful reality. Thank you so much. Uh, great presentation. Um, so your apps are built, are they like, you know, mobile apps? Or, or I'm just curious, um, where do you get them? I make them myself. I'm a developer and an artist. Where do we, I, as a consumer, get them? You get them from Steam, the App Store, Google Apps, um, Apple App Store, um, Snapchat, I suppose. And so you're going to be hardware agnostic? or Yes. Okay, that's smart because, like, Magic Leap, who knows what they're going to do. In the exactly. <laughs> well, it's all based out of Unity or Unreal Engine output ports, so it doesn't matter where we go from there. So you're you doing Unity and Unreal? You're going to use yes. those? Yes. Okay. Depending on the need of the hardware. Right. Okay. That makes sense. Oh, this, I love this. Can you talk about IP? I've been hiding it. <laughs> what, what IP do you, do you want to know about? Do you have any IP? Have you filed any IP for this? Uh, you mean uh, copyrights? Patents. Uh, oh. This is mostly copyright, but patents, if I go into hardware, will become appropriate then. So, but you have copyright, yeah. Yes, we have copyrights. Yes. Okay. And what is your traction so far? Um, Just in well, terms of feasibility and... Um, I've been teaching and around the VR and AR industry for a long time. Uh, sort of spreading my mostly marketing my classes in how to do VR and mm -hmm. AR um, so far. So I have that traction there, that um, list of students and stuff like that. But I really am looking for marketing help at this point, maybe a marketing co founder. I'm also looking for investment and um, management, I mean, uh, business advice, sure. uh, funding, and all that stuff. Great. Uh, I know a lot of people who can help you. I'm very connected in that industry, and I would love you to uh, come talk to me after. Yes, thank you. Thank you. All right, Wendy. Wendy is next with Be Gorgeous. Come on up, Wendy. Hello, everyone. How are you today so far? Wonderful. Great. 
I'm Wendy Nguyen, and today I'm going to talk about my business idea named Be Judges, a new door-to-door -door beauty services. As you guys know, everything right now is related to on-demand industries. Now we've had Uber Drive, Uber Eats, and we hope that we can create the Uber service in the beauty industries. Our purpose is to build an app that can connect provider, stylist, beauty expert to consumer who had demands. The idea of be judges come from the needs of consumer, especially the women. You know, uh, right now consumer increasingly take care of and they invest more financial resources into their appearances. A new research from New York Post reveals that American women spend nearly a quarter of a million dollars on appearance during their lifetime. They have high demands to have a good look when they have to attend some special event in their life, like wedding party, a crucial meeting, or even a very important interview. In addition, we can see that life is getting busy, and uh, we conducted a survey on 35 women from 28 to 40 years old, and 70% of them uh, said that it's a waste of time sitting in a busy and expensive beauty salon, especially when they have a last-minute appointment. Based on the needs of the consumer, we come up with a solution. That's it, the app that can uh, help you can enjoy all the beauty service in your home. And our process is very simple. It just has five uh, steps. The first one, you install and access to the app named Be Judges. You see the profile and the, the layout of the beauty expert. You brought your services. And you submit your request, confirm your location and available time. You choose the payment and purchase. And enjoy. We will connect with some appropriate provider stylists and send them to your house as soon as possible. 20 seconds left. So. The differentiation uh, between our product with other competitors is that, is that we have flexible price, we have strong consumer services to respond to them as quick as possible, and we have image consulting with reasonable prices. And that is for revenue streams of uh, big judges come from the commission fee, the advertising for cosmetic subscription model, and we collab with some partner to sell beauty products. And that's the, something we have done so far. We have website, we have marketing plan, marketing materials. Some uh, we do a lot. We did a lot of uh, consumer researches. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is, is the idea? to be that you will franchise with someone who actually delivers the service in the home when they get called? Oh, well, this is very uh, the early idea that it's not franchise. Because right now they have, we see some competitors, and then, but they don't have some service that we have, like image consulting. So, yeah. Great. My teenage daughter will very much like this. Yeah. Product. I think that women really love it, right, ladies here? Uh, it would be it would be great because I don't want to have to schedule an appointment. I decide. I yeah, it's so frustrated, it right? But I have a question about both sides of the market. When you ha when you bring uh, people who need the product together with people who uh, can provide the product, have you looked at um, uh, how much you're going to need on each side? How many consultants and, and beauty consultants you're going to need on call at all times in order to staff the you know, hotline? Yes, um, the idea is that we're gonna be build not only an app. We're gonna be a community that people join the network as much as possible. That's why we can connect with some uh, freelancer uh, who work on the beauty industries and as well as some, you know, partner with some salon, local brain, blah, blah, and then some consumer. We join like an Uber, but not Uber Eat or Uber Drive. That's an Uber industry. Then we, we can connect with together. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Thank you so much, Wendy. And for those Thank you for screaming, time. the question was more like an Upwork model rather than an Uber model, and the answer is yes. So, all right, Peter and Dylan with two bards, we're ready for Hello. you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today.
It's my pleasure to bring to you two bards. As you can see, I slaved over this uh, splash page here for us. Uh, two bards is created by myself and uh, my longtime friend and colleague, Dylan Collins. Couldn't be here today due to scheduling conflicts. But basically, we have an entertainment brand. Um, let's go on to the next slide, please. We have characters here, Bardo and Bardadocious, and they live in a magical world. We plan to bring everybody to become familiar with Bardo and Bardadocious and uh, their fun and exciting adventures. Um, we have already have established an Instagram webcomic with 150 users. Uh, they seem quite pleased with the product so far. Uh, we plan to expand into animations, uh, potentially pitching a show. Uh, we are currently working on some videos for YouTube, music potentially to be shared through the videos and or Bandcamp, SoundCloud, and also there's potential for a video game or video games. Uh, the freebies out there, so far so good. Another thing we're looking at is potential licensing. So if we develop the idea enough, we could bring it to someone who wants to merchandise or potentially share uh, these characters. Next slide, please. All right, so right here we have the world of the two bards, and it's a psychedelic and interesting place uh, set in a medieval fantasy world. We're paying homage to tabletop uh, desk, uh, gaming, which is like Dungeons and Dragons, things of that nature. There is a growing market in this, and uh, next slide, please. So here we are again with the bards. These are some examples of our, our Instagram comic. And it's, uh, you can see that they're very color colorful and interesting characters. And we're looking to share more of their personality with you through continuing to create content. Next slide, please. All right, so the market. The entertainment market is blowing up, and it's only getting more and more involved, and it's all pushing online. So that's where we're coming in. Uh, you can see the blue bars are growing over time. <laughs> and 30, that is- 30 seconds left. That is the money being invested. Um, so here we are, uh, here's another picture, 8-bit uh, versions that could be used as game characters in retro. Retro is a big uh, appeal, good aesthetic. Next slide, please. Uh, customer base, uh, gamers, sci-fi, fantasy enthusiasts, Males, 18 to 34, now this is based off, uh, it's comparable to Rick and Morty. Uh, we want you to think of our product as Dumb and Dumber meets Lord of the Rings. So lots of humor, and I'd like to share that with you. Uh, next slide, please. So we're looking for collaboration, mentorship, and funding opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? So this is really exciting. I'm just interested to hear sort of um, where, you're, where you're taking this. Um, where do you think is the next um, thing to sort of go from 150 to, you know, whatever your next milestone is? It's a, a really great job with your presentation overall, by the way. Thank you. Uh, yes, so right now we're trying to streamline and standardize our art because when we began six months ago, it was kind of rough. And so now, uh, working with Dylan, and, and we've tried to streamline the art and just make it more uh, identifiable and to increase the, the quality. So scaling is the next big thing for us. And I'm definitely looking for mentoring, uh, business opportunities. A lot of what we've been looking at uh, in this class isn't specifically catered to our entertainment industry. So one of my big things now is to create what they call a pitch bible and see if I can get some traction, either Netflix or Cartoon Network, and grow that way as well. Great. Uh, great presentation, just real quickly. Just curious, what were your numbers when you said you released your webcomic six months ago on Instagram? How well was it received? Um, it's been growing organically, and we do very little marketing right now. I'm um, actually signed up to do a social media marketing next uh, semester at City College, shout out to that. Um, so I'm continuing to do market research and learn and grow as an artist and a business person. So I'm not trying to expand too quickly right now, but uh, with collaboration, uh, I, see, I see that being a possibility. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. All right, we're ready for the ultimate beatdown.
Hi, my name is Luis Robles. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, my company is Ultimate Vita. Ultimate Vita is a five sport lifestyle brand. Um, I started it to motivate, inspire, to go harder. Um, I've, I've been wrestling since the age of 11 and involved in men's martial arts for about 15, 16 years. That's the reason I started this company behind my passion. Um, Ultimate Beatdown is a, a product company. We're on phase one, we're trying to develop apparel and uh, equipment. Phase two will be supplements and nutrition. And phase three will be the Ultimate Beatdown Center where young adults, youth could come in, learn wrestling and mixed martial arts, and we'll be able to support them in academics by giving them tutoring. And um, we'll also do workshops and technology, anything that will benefit our, our athletes, we'll try to provide for them. Um, Sorry, a little nervous. <laughs> You're doing great. Uh, the MMA market, uh, it's been growing. Uh, right now, uh, the market has been growing for the last 10 years. The sport of big martial arts has been considered uh, the fastest growing sport in the world. Uh, from now to 2024, the market is estimated to reach 111 billion dollars. So uh, when you look at the opportunity, the opportunity is there, especially internationally. Um, the players, the other companies that are currently in the space are big companies because they see the opportunity. Companies like Reebok have uh, come into the space. Um, a lot of fans don't feel they're authentic. Another company that is in the, in the space and started from it is Roots of Fighting. They have moved on ten, to entertainment. Ten seconds left. And other areas. Uh, Again, they're, they're not authentic. Um, the reason I stand in front of you is to ask for mentorship, um, product development, and marketing. And that's where I, what I need right now to move forward. And I'm willing to partner up or, or take any advice that you might give. Great. Thank you. Yes. So um, I think this is a, a really good uh, market and good focus. That's that's really great, uh, a nice advantage that you have. Um, I will. I have something. I there's a a, uh, a store in New York and L.A. and they're focused on this particular um, audience or, or target customer. And I will try to. I have. I bought one of their things. So. <laughs> Um, but that is some nice validation for you for that uh, area of focus. And um, one of the things that you did really, really well is you identified how you um, really understand sort of the customers and what they like and don't like. So you're a deep expert. Thank and, you. <laughs> and, and you told us that. Um, so I, I wish you luck with this. Thank you. Um, open to mentorship or anything from all of you, any of you. So. I'll be around. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We're ready for threshold petition. Come on up. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Madeline Whitehill, and I'm working uh, with a team of talented, wonderful individuals on Threshold Petition, which is a secure digital platform to empower legislators challenging the status quo. Um, so I have a news flash. Not all legislators are bad. <laughs> They're simply caught in a system that undermines the best of intentions. Legislators who challenge party leadership find themselves stranded on an island. See that? Wonderful. Uh, met with punishment ranging from petty acts of stripping a legislator of their, legis of their office furniture to effectively ending the legislator's career. Legislators are left feeling frustrated and defeated in the face of the current system. My experiences as a volunteer lobbyist gave me firsthand insight into the lack of viable avenues to challenge the status quo. While working for an anti-corruption bill, I kept hearing the same thing from legislators across the aisle. They recognized the need for reform, privately supported it, 
and yet they didn't dare sign their name. Just like the children's story, the emperor's new clothes, no one wants to be that person, the first one to challenge the status quo. Threshold petition was born out of exasperation. I kept thinking, if legislators individually agree, what is stopping them from harnessing the power of, of the ability to gain power in numbers? What they need is protection during the most vulnerable phase of consensus building to make that first step. One minute left. Okay. Threshold petition is a digital platform that allows legislators to connect with one another anonymously to build consensus. They can act as a protected block because we make sure that their names are only revealed after they have reached critical mass. So, if the villagers from the emperor's new clothes had access to threshold petition, they could have avoided the period in which, indiv as individuals, they were paralyzed by fear. Uh, also, next slide. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Anonymously, they could have submitted a petition of concern using Threshold Petition's secure online platform, allowing them to gather support. Their concerns would have become public only once they had reached critical mass. We, too, can empower legislators to speak up for the will of the people, even in the face of kings. I've received overwhelmingly positive feedback from a diverse group of legislators, policy analysts, advocacy organizations, and professors. I'm currently working with a small but brilliant and talented group of volunteers. And here's what I'm asking today of my fellow villagers. If threshold petition sparked your interest, message us, especially if you align with any of the listed geographics, which is in the next. Okay, list. thank you. We're going we're gonna to ask a question Wonderful. now. Thank you. Go ahead, John. This is absolutely great. I love the way you used in your presentation the story of the emperor with no clothes and tied it through to explain your product. That was excellent. Thank and I really want to talk to you about your product afterwards. I'm, my next big mission is to create a new political party that is, oh. um, that is common sense. Ah, that's great. It feels like there are a lot of potential use cases beyond yes. um, city government, and I think the classroom is a yes. great potential use case. I'm just wondering what other yes. um, uh, outlets you thought about. Yes, you mean like perhaps if a, um, a board is unsatisfied with their college, uh, their college head? Um, just theoretically. Yeah, yeah. Or, for example, if, you, if a workplace uh, wanted to unionize, but there were anti-union laws in place. Or if, uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, have you heard of a company called Blind? Yes. Uh, how do you differentiate from them? Because they're yeah. similar lines. Yeah. Uh, so Blind is doing some really interesting work. Uh, the, the, and if I can just give a little bit. For, Full disclaimer, they're a former client. Oh, yeah. Well, that's, that's great. Wonderful. We should are talk. You, are you interested in talking to them? I, I, absolutely. I, okay. Absolutely. Right. Come so, find me after. So rather than competitors, you know, I, I have a research doc that is in t it, it, uh, labeled opportunities. <laughs> you know, I'd love to talk with these people. Um, so the difference is that with blind, there's not that transition period that allows for that next step in initiating action. And what threshold petition seeks to do is, get, is bridge that gap between what traditional uh, threshold, sorry, what traditional petition sites are doing, uh, which is completely out in the, in the open, and then sites that are that are closed, like blind. Right. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay, we are ready for the next presentation. That was great. Thank you. All right. Hi, good, good afternoon or evening. My name is Cesar Espinoza Perez. I am the founder of Social Justice Queer Trans. 
I'm an LGBT activist, sex worker rights activist. Does anyone recognize uh, this person? Yes, Harvey Milk, I heard it out, yes. Legendary LGBT activist, was murdered at City Hall uh, by Supervisor Dan White. Um, so I'm gonna tell, I'm gonna, I'm gonna introduce you to two, two wonderful women. Um, Ruby Rodriguez was, uh, she immigrated from Nicaragua. She was a trans sex worker. Her life was tragically cut short um, and her body was found uh, at Cesar Chavez in Indiana. And Malaysia Booker, uh, this, um, this year, she was a victim of mob violence and a month later, she came out, she, she, uh, she came out did a, a, a press release against the violence. A month later, she was found um, in front of her home, murdered. So there's a big problem. We, we're in a crisis right now of violence, especially towards trans and sex workers. Um, LGBT sex workers have been oppressed, have been discriminated against, and continue to be killed. Um, and city, city lawmakers have not yet passed any legislation to address this. Um, and several residents and people have, have spoke to uh, do not feel that the police will protect them or will uh, follow up on reported violent crimes. And our survey that was conducted recently found that over 50% of of uh, trans people who have been homeless or um, have, have been un, um, unstably housed in the past year have been harassed by the police. Uh, so our vision is to make San Francisco the safest, safest region in the world, especially for sex workers, trans, and um, queers. One minute left. Our, our mission is to pass anti-oppressive laws and policies. Uh, so today we met with supervisor, uh, legislative, legislative aid for Super Mandelman, Supervisor Mandelman's office, and we introduced an outline of the of the legislation that we're working on. Uh, what it would do is it would stop SFPD from arresting sex workers completely, um, because oppressive policies are really are one of the causes of violence. To be honest. Um, so right now, I also volunteer on the human the anti human trafficking task force. And the police asked us for help in addressing the increase in street-based sex work. We met with them, and the meeting started off with the benefits of arrest. So we want to we want to make sure that the police have that the police do c come out and do participate in commu community policing. But we want to be there. We want to be part of the strategy that they develop for public safety. Um, we're also organizing. We're we're organizing our communities uh, at St. James Infirmary, at Ella, to kind of build our ass as the legislators. What they're asking for is, um, what they're asking for is re preventing violent crimes, and preventing hate crimes, and preventing hate legislation. Recently, we passed a state bill, thanks to the coalition, um, SB 233, which prevents, uh, if you are a victim of violent crime, in, uh, it's, it will start in next year, in January, where you can go to the police and the police will not arrest you if you're a sex worker, which was critical because you're afraid to report violence against you. Uh, so pretty much what we're asking for is mentorship, feedback, and to be involved with um, this pub public safety strategy to keep all of us safe, really. Thank you for coming again to share with us. It was, uh, it's really nice to see that you have had progress since our last pitch night. And congratulations on that. And uh, I know that you do a lot uh, for your community, and so we honor you for that. Um, I know that last time uh, a couple of us had said that we were interested in helping, so it's really important that today that you connect with us so that we can provide some level of support for you moving forward. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go ahead and take the next uh, person. Um, okay, we're ready for you. Why don't you grab the microphone? Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Uh, hello, everyone. 
my name is Mikolai. I am founder of RoboJuice. Uh, juicing industry have a number of issues. Traditional style, for example, Jamba Juice, Smoothie King, and other companies to prepare juice and smoothie use frozen fruits, which is not a healthy ingredient. High upfront cost to open one franchise Jamba Juice location, you need to invest 300,000 K plus 30,000 for initial fee. And uh, expensive uh, operation cost, organization work process, you need a lot of manual labor. And long wait time, you need to wait your order five to seven minutes. Automated technology, they also use frozen fruits. They use expensive robot automatization, a limited menu. They prepare only smoothies because make juice, juices more difficult automation process. And uh, also long wait time, you need to wait your order four to five minutes. Our solution, this is... Robot Juice, world's first robotic juice bar, which can make delicious fresh juices and smoothies in just a second and do it with culinary excellence. Robot Juice smart, fast, and cost-effective. Let's uh, see our uh, progress and our solution. This is a robotics arm with hydraulic drive. This is own technology to prepare juice and smoothie. This is very affordable solution. This is our second prototype. We, we develop and use peeling machine uh, juicer machine, testing robotics arm. This is our currently prototype. We develop several technology like dispenser system for fruits, self-cleaning blender to prepare smoothie, interface robot to communicate with customers, uh, modernization industrial juicer machine, and other technology. Yeah. Uh, this is dispensing system for prepared juices. It is just render. And uh, this is our design, our material, our patent, and uh, other in our team. Uh, our market strategy, we plan to install RoboJuice kiosk in play like Amazon Go, airports, university, and other places. Ten uh, seconds left. We have uh, co two competitors, Albert Company from Europe. They have five locations and continue to grow. And Company from San Francisco, they have one location with good market direction. However, none of them offers uh, fresh and gardening fruits, interactive customer experience, afford affordable price, uh, entertainment, and wide-ranging menu. Uh, All right. Well, we thank, thank you. We're yeah. going to jump in. So, yeah, I, I've been seeing these internationally. So, congratulations on jumping into a market that is uh, growing and happening. Any questions? I just have a quick question. Um, I, we have a um, coffee similar in a co -work, er, to, at the co-working space, and what I see is that it's empty most of the time, and then all of a sudden there will be a super long line. How do you accommodate um, uh, different crowd sizes throughout the day? Uh, one, uh, one, one more time, please. I, I just start English one month ago, sorry. Yeah. So, um, when I see this, when I see something, uh, there's a, a similar situation with a coffee maker in front of our uh, building. And what I see is that the crowds come at one or two times during the day, mm -hmm. and it's not spread out. So there's a long line, yeah. and that creates the, the friction rather you, than... You, you mean how we, uh, we make a faster speed or no? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, we, we, we use hydraulic drive uh, to, uh, uh, to prepare, uh, to work our robotics arm. This is a very faster solution. Yes, and uh, yeah, I think uh, if you... This question... <laughs> Is this an answer? Yeah, M maybe after I talk with you and ask answer. Sorry. Well, we were all very impressed. You just learned English one month ago. Wow. I'm, I'm still working on English myself. Uh, we're ready for the next. We're ready for the next presentation. Come on up. Oh, okay. I remember you guys. Congratulations on all your success since the last. Uh, Pitch event. I, right over here. Why don't you grab that? You're a pitching pro now. Got it down. I'm ready to be impressed. Get us. We're ready for you.
<laughs> so when I was a child, my parents made sure that we recycled our glass bottles, our plastic bottles, and our aluminum cans. But they stopped doing so a few years ago. You see, they work long hours and no longer see the value of going to a recycling center and standing in line for small amounts of money. But I always knew that there was real value in recycling, and it sparked the desire in me to learn everything I could about its benefits to society and humanity. But what I found was shocking. I found that every day, 1,440,000,000 plastic bottles are sold around the world, and almost 80% of that will end up in our forests or oceans. Americans alone dumped 242 million pounds of plastic into our ocean last year, and California is in a recycling crisis as half of all centers have closed within the past four years. So we asked, why aren't people recycling? We came up with three answers. The first is a general inconvenience. Independent recycling companies have not adjusted to today's convenience-driven society. People are no longer willing to stand in line at a recycling center for small amounts of money. The second is a lack of accessibility. With more centers closing, more communities are being left without options to take advantage of the value of their recycling. The third is a lack of a quality education on the matter. Both independent and government-sponsored recycling companies have failed to educate communities about how each individual's recycling contributes to the betterment of our, of our environment. And all three of these factors have led to America's declining recycling rate of only 34.7%. But to solve this, we created Green Waste, which is the first mobile recycling service that will serve any residence, business, or school that wants to earn money from the value of their recycling. So we provide, we provide accessibility and convenience by providing each of our users with 50-gallon eco-friendly bins for their CRV materials. And once a bin is full, they will request to pick up through a mobile application, and one of our drivers will arrive to collect their materials. The monetary value of the materials will be divided amongst the user, the driver, and green waste. But addressing both these issues is pointless if we don't address the lack of a quality education on the matter. To do so, green waste will provide each user with an individual diversion rate based on measured statistics of the amount that they recycled while using our service. We will also send, regularly send notifications depicting real-world scenarios of how their own recycling habits are helping to save the world. For example, I'll receive a text that says, congratulations, you recycled 100 pounds last month, which is the equivalent of removing 10 square meters from the Pacific garbage patch. We are the left. change that, that the world needs to solve our recycling crisis. By making recycling personal to each individual user, we know that we can bring an excitement back to recycling that has never been seen before. And through that excitement, we can all change the world one bottle at a time. Thank you. It's wonderful. wonderful. Um, so I saw you pitch back in April, and I just want to say how proud I am of you and how much you've progressed. I mean, just your confidence, your everything. It's very clear that you've been working hard on this, and I just want to say great job, and I'm, I'm super impressed. Absolutely. Thank you. That was an outstanding presentation, very professional. Thank you. Thank you so much. One of the challenges that the industry faces is that the foreign consumers of our recycled products have, have stopped buying. Right? Yeah, absolutely so right. that's yes. crashed the value. How do you manage that uh, commodity value swing that occurs occasionally based on forces far beyond your control? Absolutely, for sure. So, yeah, one of the things that we've been tracking is the price of um, the materials, whether it's BET, plastics, aluminum, and glass. They've all pretty much fluctuated within five cents within the past four years. They haven't really changed that much, so it doesn't vary that much. And one of the things that we found also from research is that China, let's say our, our largest importer of recycling, stopped accepting our recycling uh, last year because one of the reasons, obviously, there's a trade embargo and stuff like that, but one of the reasons is also a purity rate. You know, we're sending the materials that are they're becoming contaminated with not only the, the plastic materials that they need, but also cardboard and, uh, you know, things that, that aren't what they want. So then they're not accepting it. They want a 99% purity rate. And what we want to do is we want to incentivize people to not throw um, all their recyclables into a bin, such as the one that you see outside. You know, there's a bunch of things there. It's confusing. But if we can really incentivize people to use these three uh, materials, the CRV, plastic, aluminum, and glass, and we can isolate those materials, then we can, we can achieve a purity rate that would be incentivizing for, for people to, to, to receive. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Great. I, I, believe this is the, I believe this is the last pitch. And two more. Okay, so there's two more. And um, we would have been on time, but we kept adding pitches. We just can't get enough of this. All right. We're ready for you.
Your microphone's right there on the podium. Hello, my name is Latoya Golar, and I'm the founder of American UMA, and we create dope apparel for the masses. So I've been a fashion designer for the past 20 years, and I noticed that there is a problem in the industry. Like, the fashion market today is just too sexy, or it's overly modest. Like, either you're Britney Spears or you're the Virgin Mary, right? <laughs> All right. It's a lack of options. People need UV protection. Um, it's a bad fit, and my question for everyone here in tech world is how can you ha have wearable technology when you don't have clothes on? So the future is covered. What we're looking at is a half a trillion dollar global uh, market with a demand for modest clothing and cover fashion up 200 and 300% in uh, Google searches. And also it's the sign of the times. It's the death of sexy, and Kim Kardashian is now modest. <laughs> 70% of our customers are non-Muslim, which are commonly associated with being covered. Next. So I want to introduce you to Elements. I have a model here who's going to be putting our Elements on. It allows our customer to mix and match their uh, covered options for different parts of their body. So some of our uh, most popular are the stellar in the orbit for the head and the district for the bottom and connect sector and connectors for the chest. So she's going to be putting that on while I talk. Okay. <laughs> so every six weeks we have a new collection where our uh, cu customers can select from different themes. It creates a mix and match, collect them all type of, of, of collection where users just have to have it all. So we use a process of sublimation, um, which allows customers to customize and personalize their collection and a bespoke apparel. Um, that we use, we, not all of it, but we use 100% recycled fabric and also biodegradable uh, uh, material. Uh, our traction, uh, we've got, well, at this point, we're almost at 10,000 in sales. Uh, we've been featured in 16 magazines, 27 showcases in 10 cities in three countries. Um, AU is in demand. We have a proof of concept and been invited to prestigious fashion weeks all over the world. Um, our competitors have inflexible designs and they're marketed in Muslim, I mean, clo modest clothing to the Muslim market, but we have an interchangeable de designs that create dope covered apparel for everybody. So our golden market strategy is a dope, joint AU Nation dope covered apparel tour, also partnering collaborations with different brands, crowdfunding our mobile website and app, social media, and our general store for job shipping. Our team includes our COO right there, <laughs> Catherine Schuller, um, who is uh, an instructor at FIT uh, New York, and also Savita K with uh, the, um, a member of the World Fashion Council in London. Oh, okay, so okay. our ask cool. is, uh, uh, we're asking for 100,000 um, to help build out our 3D avatar app so you become your avatar. Um, our own sublimation printer, our uh, bulk um, of an eco-friendly fabric, our patent in our studio location. So here she is. <laughs> It's a really impressive presentation. Congratulations on the success you've had with uh, press and marketing. Thank you. We have time for one question, if anybody has one. Have you looked at how well um, other brands in the modest market are doing, and who are you looking at that you feel like, oh, these people really get it, they understand what the potential is um, outside of uh, the two kind of extremes that you have identified? Well, right now, um, I, I feel like it's a big, um, it's a big uh, niche in the market because um, the creators uh, like Dosia Gabbana and DKNY and Nike and all these people going into the cover market, they're going after that 
particular Muslim customer. But my, my, that's not my, my customer. My customer is actually people who want more modest options because they aren't available. So this allows uh, us to market to anyone who wants to just be more modest with um, the different options. So it expands kind of, yeah. Thank you so much. All right, we are ready for the last presentation. Come on up, gentlemen. We're ready for you. Is this, is this on? Okay. Um, quick disclaimer, me and my partner Austin, we're still in high school. We're not looking for investors and mentors. This was more for the experience of taking the class. Um, we, our company is The Branch Thing. It, here. Okay. Uh, the Branch Thing is a fork off of an already existing company, The Thing Quarterly, which is an art subscription. It's a little more expensive. It's higher end. They partner with some big artists, some well-known, some not so well-known, and we're catering to a younger market, so around our age. Teenagers through the SFUSD school system are becoming more politically active and more interested in the arts. So we are going to, we decided to open up a printing idea to partner with artists that we find interesting and who find un us interesting in the local areas. Um, this is kind of a demo of our website. We used Andy Warhol. This is, we're not selling this for legal reasons. Um, <laughs> this is kind of a demo of what it would look like. Uh, the people we've reached out to, we're still working things out. So we haven't, we haven't had a set person yet so we use this as a prototype this is kind of the website that we're going to be using we already have an e-commerce platform um we have you know not in stock all that good stuff um so the market it's teenagers around our age we reached out to them through surveys and instagram um they we found that here oh yeah our biggest competitor is uniqlo they're a big corporation. We can't really compete with them. They are much more competitive. So to combat that, we will not be selling things that they will be selling. We'll be working with smaller, more local artists. Um, uh, we'll be selling locally, smaller scale before we can expand. And then these are kind of the logistics of, of how we'll be selling the shirts. And then Austin, you wanted to, uh, you're going to talk about the vision. Oh. All right, um, we plan on selling them at like, or buying the shirts at like two, no, 726 from this one website. I'm not sure. I can't quite remember which one. And we'll be selling them around $15, sometimes more, sometimes less. And um, at like rallies and such, like political rallies, we will be capitalizing on people's emotion for, um, I guess, their political emotion. Like recently Trump rallies and such, and like LGBT movements. And for the artists, they'll make 60% of the profits. Okay, thank you guys. So just, just one thing that would have uh, strengthened your proposal is to wear examples. Because um, right now I can't, you know, I, I really want to see what you're talking about. So just, just for future. Okay. But good for getting up here and, and, and going for it. Yeah, thank you. Sorry about that. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, the judges, uh, John, why don't you come on up? We're ready for you. And uh, the judges, we're going to collaborate and decide on the three winners. And um, we appreciate the patience of those that are in the audience. We did add a few pitches, so it extended our time a bit. But we're going to tighten up the end and, and still wrap up very quickly. But we also want to give our attention to uh, John Pimentel. We asked him to come for a reason. He's the type of guy, when he speaks, people listen. I encourage you to right now. Zach, would you like to introduce our keynote speaker? Hello? Yeah, perfect. All right. 
Ah, okay, so uh, while the judges are deliberating, we're going to have our keynote speaker, Mr. John Pimentel. My name is Zachary Lamb. I'm the assistant director for our Strong Workforce Program, which has the honor of supporting our Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, today I get to introduce John. John is a serial founder, entrepreneur, public servant, investor, and he's launched several companies. Uh, but before he became a founder, before he got his MBA at Harvard Business School, before he got his BA from UC Berkeley, before all of that, John got his start at a community college, earning his associate's degree from San Joaquin Delta Community College. Since then, John's been very busy. Uh, he went on to found a number of companies, all of them focused on uh, green energy and sustainability. Uh, in 2003, John co-founded Pacific Ethanol, a leading ethanol producer. And he was the co-founder and CEO of Pinoche, uh, Pinoche Valley Solar, which brought solar power to San Benito County. John is currently the co-founder and president of both Sustainable Water Solutions, a water treatment and services company, as well as Foundation Wind Power, which builds and operates wind projects. He is also the founder of White Hat Renewables, which invests in wind, solar, and other green energy product, pro, uh, projects. All this to say, I think I said the word founder maybe five times in there. Uh, so John has been very prodigious in his work to support sustainability uh, in our environment. Uh, and so we're really lucky to have him here today. And I think he is almost ready to go. Um, yeah, so <laughs> what else can I tell you about John? Uh, Oh, he's ready now. Okay, great. So without further ado, John Pimentel. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's great to be here. I am going to uh, shamelessly uh, rip off a presentation that I got to uh, enjoy when I was in business school from one of the entrepreneurial finance professors who actually used this exact same title called So You Want to Be an Entrepreneur. Um, uh, I, I was invited here, I think, because at this stage of my life, I've accumulated enough scar tissue from having, uh, having done enough startups that perhaps I have something useful to uh, share with you, either for your career or for your life. So the first question is, um, what, is an, what is an entrepreneur? If the slides will flip to the next one, we're OK. Um, An entrepreneur is someone who creates something of value from nothing. All these pitches that I just saw uh, for the last couple hours were amazing because what you guys are doing is literally taking nothing more than an idea and turning it into something of value. That can, be, that can take a number of forms. Um, when we think of entrepreneurs, sometimes we go immediately to the famous uh, the famous and uh, powerful and rich uh, uh, entrepreneurs who created big businesses. So Thomas Edison was a, an inventor who had over a thousand patents and really created for the first time the concept of, of creation in uh, a corporate laboratory to come up with new ideas. He also founded General Electric and uh, brought millions of us literally into the light. Uh, second, uh, pers the second example is uh, Bill Gates, we think of him as uh, someone who's created something, but in fact his product literally you couldn't even touch. A lot of the things that we saw today in our presentations uh, were more ideas in, in, uh, in the digital space. And of course, um, Gates has had a huge impact in the way that he's taken his trillion dollar company and gone out to fight uh, poverty globally. Third uh, example is a fellow named Robert Smith. He took an idea uh, he, w he started out as a chemist and a banker. He ended up creating something called Vista Equity Partners, where he buys and sells companies. And uh, he had a pretty big idea, which uh, was in the news recently, where he forgave the debt of uh, a whole class, graduating class from Morehouse, uh, making about 400 students very happy. But it's not just uh, business or money that makes a difference. Uh, entrepreneurs can be in the social sector, too. So Cesar Chavez grew up uh, in Yuma, Arizona, joined the Navy, moved to Silicon Valley when there were more fruit trees than there were uh, startup companies, and uh, ended up committing his life 
to building the United Farm Workers, which in turn had a massive impact on hundreds, millions of people in their working conditions uh, ar around the world. Uh, another big thinker is Lin-Manuel Miranda, who took a crazy idea, uh, his own artistic interest in uh, the theater and in history, to create this wonderful musical, hopefully you've had a chance to see Hamilton. Uh, and it, in, in and of itself was actually about a, a person, Alexander Hamilton, who came from nothing and turned his, uh, his idea into what is now our US financial system. So uh, the idea doesn't also have to be just about um, money or business or, or even politics. Uh, the, uh, the Buddha was a prince who uh, gave up everything on his 29th birthday and moved into the woods to philosophize and consider uh, uh, life and ended up creating a philosophy and religion that is practiced by over a half billion people in the world. So being an entrepreneur can be a lot of things. And in fact, I would argue you guys are all entrepreneurs. Part of what you're doing by, is creating something out of nothing. The decision that you've made to come to City College is a pretty important one. When you think about uh, the elements of, of, uh, of college and what you have to do to get there, um, you've got to first pay tuition, then you've got to pay room and board, and you've got to come up with that uh, cash. So you've all made a brilliant decision by coming to City College. It is the screaming best deal in America. You're getting a great education. You're under your uh, lower division work is essentially the same work that's done at any other college but you're spending $1,400 uh, a semester to do that. And if you're willing to live at home and hang out with your parents and uh, uh, suffer the indignities of being a young adult living under the uh, roof of your folks and under their rules, you don't have to pay room and board either. You end up going to, uh, to university for your last two years, you'll spend closer to $30,000 a year, even at the UC system. And if you uh, hit the lottery and get a, uh, a ticket into a university like Harvard, you'll have the pleasure of paying two times what you would pay for a University of California. So if you think as an entrepreneur, as you all have been, and look at the savings that you can create literally just by doing your first two years at the community college, you'll save $30,000 a year, $60,000 total. Invest that. In seven years, it's worth $150,000. In 10 years, it's going to be worth $300,000. You will have that money in your pocket, uh, hopefully, to make your life better. So you're, you're also entrepreneurs because today you're going to get the deal of the day. I'm going to actually give you three presentations in one uh, where you'll, uh, you'll get to learn the what, the how, and the why of entrepreneurialism. And uh, the first piece is, uh, is what. So the deal that you'll get is I'm going to boil down an entire Harvard Business School two-year education, which costs about a couple hundred thousand dollars, into one single slide. Um, some of you already know uh, this, and I saw in the presentations a lot of you thought uh, deeply about some of these items. But it's important to understand the basics of business. It's really not that tough. You have a business where you sell stuff and you create revenue. It takes cost for you to deliver that stuff. And if your revenue is greater than your cost, your business is successful. So how do you move the needle on those? For revenue, you have two things you can do. First, you can increase your volume or you can increase your price. Those are the two levers that you can move uh, to increase your top line. Sell more stuff or increase the price of the stuff that you do sell. How do you do that? Well, there's only two ways to do it. You either sell more or you innovate in a way that makes people want to pay more for your product, right? Like you're, uh, will, they're willing to pay a great deal for your fashion, for instance, because you've innovated in something that is otherwise not done. As far as managing your costs, you want to make your costs as low as possible. There's, there's two key pieces to that, the fixed costs and variable costs. Uh, your fixed costs are the ones that are your overhead, things that just by going into business you're going to have to figure out how to pay for. Whether it's an office, your computers, your, uh, your HR person, your, hopefully you don't have to spend too much money on lawyers. Um, 
and then you have your variable costs, which actually rise and fall with your productivity. So if you sell more stuff, you need more cost of goods sold. Uh, those are two. Those are the two main elements. But again, there's really two ways that you deal with that. You either have to reduce your cost by negotiating with your suppliers to get lower prices, or innovating to make your stuff faster, better, cheaper, so that you can do it at a lower cost. Uh, at the end of the day, if you're good, you'll have profit, and you'll be forced with a, uh, a decision to either reinvest in the business or harvest and take that money out and enjoy some of the fruits of your labor. So there you have it. Business is that simple. I know you all know it. And it's so easy to get caught up in the complexity of what your product is or how you're taking it to market or what your strategy is. But literally, if you just keep in mind on that simple equation, you'll do fine. Um, the next uh, thing is how. How do you go about doing this? And I say there's a few things to consider. First, you've got to gain experience. So you guys are here. This is incredible experience that uh, Ian and the team have created for you to pitch your business and see how, uh, how this works in the real world. Um, but you also need to go get real world experience with your, uh, with your jobs. So how do you get that experience? You have to actually go out and do the work. So um, I of often give young people advice, especially for their first few years out of school. If you can get into a situation where you're in a large company, where you're learning from people who know more about what's happening in that industry that you want to get into, that's a great place to be because you'll get a branded experience that'll set you up for whatever you might want to do academically later in your life. But most importantly, it gives you the context in the industry so that you can make good decisions when you go start up your own business. The uh, the next thing to think about, and sometimes this happens while you're gaining experience, is find a perch. So in the same way that there might be, uh, you might envision a, a, a hawk sitting on a fence post waiting uh, for his opportunity to have lunch, you want to get into a position where you can have a perch on which you can watch uh, business happen. You participate in it, you look for your opportunities, and you develop expertise in your field. But then, if you're on the right perch where you've seen a lot of things go by, you'll see something that you like, and you'll be ready to go jump on it. And you'll be prepared for it because you've been getting the experience uh, in, your, in your early career. And then, uh, lastly, when it's time to go, you go. And a lot of people make this mistake where they think, oh, I'm just going to start my company. I'm going to work at night. I'm going to kind of bootstrap my way through it. I'm not going to tell anybody about it until I've proven that the concept is out there and that it works. The fact is, you've got to go. And when you go, go loud. Make a big, hairy, audacious goal. Tell everybody in the world about it. And that will help motivate you to go get it done. Once you've committed to make your big, hairy, audacious plan work, then you'll, um, you'll realize that you've told your, your friends, your family, your classmates, and before you know it, you're so hooked on the opportunity, you've got to go make it happen. The second thing you want to do is called launch the missile. So you might not really know exactly how you're going to get your business built. You might have a pretty good idea of the market, of the product, of the vendors that you'll have to work with or the customers that you'll have to attract. But you might not know exactly how to get from point A to point B. The military analogy that I use sometimes is when the Allies landed on Normandy, they knew they needed to get onto the beach. They knew they needed to get to Berlin. But they weren't exactly sure how they were going to get from point A to point B. But they knew that the only way they were going to get home is if they went through Berlin. So they made a big announcement. They launched the missile. They hit the beach. And they figured it out how they went. So you're going to do the same thing today. And the step that you took today to put these presentations together really was in some ways launching your missile. You're out there now. Now you've got to live up to what you've created. And then lastly, um, you've got to be the rhino. Um, for those of you who have ever seen a rhino at the zoo or in real life, uh, you know that they have very, very thick skin. Huge horn up front to plow into things and dig things up. But no matter what hits them as they're moving through the forest, they're not obstructed or they're not slowed down. They're not damaged. They'll take plenty of nicks and they'll keep going. The other thing about a rhino that a lot of people don't know is 
they can't move backwards. Literally, they physically cannot move backwards. And there are stories, I don't know if it's a true story or if it's just lore, of a rhino running into a wall, not being able to back up in the wall. The only way you get the rhino out of the situation is to dismantle the wall. So when you have launched your missile, you've told all your friends and family that you're going to go be an entrepreneur and make your business happen. You have to be a rhino. You have to keep moving forward and you have to go aggressively after whatever it is you're going to do. In my life, in my career, I had several examples of this. One of them was, uh, as it was described before, I, I created a huge solar farm. I, I didn't know how a solar panel even worked, but I told all my friends I was going to go build this massive solar farm with uh, three square miles worth of solar panels in San Benito County. And eight years later, it happened. Uh, but it wasn't without taking a lot of nicks. Uh, and if I had not been a rhino in that process, it definitely would not have happened. So the last piece of the puzzle, as you think about all this stuff, is why? Why do you want to be an entrepreneur? What is it that you're trying to accomplish? Some people want to be an entrepreneur for wealth. They want the fast cars or the big mansions or uh, the stuff. But at the end of the day, that's only stuff. And that stuff will come and go from your life, and it might seem important now, especially when you don't have a lot of stuff, but later in life when you have more, you realize it's just stuff. Some people want to get into being entrepreneurs for fame. They want to walk the red carpet or be in the newspapers all the time, and fame comes and goes as well. As we said, we even know from your presentation, Kim Kardashian's now modest. Fame changes. Uh, third, some people maybe want to be in, an entrepreneur uh, for power. And what is, what, you know, there are plenty of reasons why, uh, why you can um, pursue that or why you would want to pursue that. Um, being powerful is probably nice for the people who are powerful, but it has some downsides too. So at the end of the day, the question is, what is it you really want to get at the end of the process? Right now, you're at the beginning of the process where it feels scary. You're not sure what you're going to do. You're not sure if you're going to succeed. But one of the motivations that helps you be the rhino is to think about why you're doing it. And one of the things that motivated me was to think that I could make a difference in the world. So in the various businesses uh, that I started, I, or as I started back at the beginning of my career, I, nobody had ever told me this, so I'm wanting to share it with you now. The fact is, you really have about 30 or 35 productive years of your life. You're, you're, for those of you who are in the normal age for starting community college, you're 18, 20, 22 years old. And um, you don't, it's, it's hard to figure out what exactly you're going to do with your life. But the fact is, um, as you bump through your 20s, you're in that learning period, right, with the shovel. You're gaining experience. But as you reach your late 20s and get into your 30s, you become much more productive. You start to have experience. You, heart, you start to re recognize patterns. You can make good decisions about who you associate with, what you try and do, how you spend your time. And then you have, literally, 30 years to make something happen in the world before you start to slow down, lose your energy. I know you think you never will, but it happens. So what are you going to do with those 30 or 35 years? Are you going to just pursue the fast car or the power or the fame? or are you going to try and make a difference? And the fact is, we've only got one of these. And so for those of you who are dedicating your time and effort and professional life to try and make the world a better place, that's great. It happens not just physically, but also emotionally, socially, in the products that you deliver. Some people have their impact just in how they um, affect their company and the people who work for them. Some people have a mission-driven enterprise that uh, is really what they're their whole company is about. So I was lucky enough in my, in my uh, various businesses to produce enough renewable energy that uh, generates enough electricity for about 75,000 homes. So I can say that I did something good in the world while also taking care of the most important part, which it's very easy to forget about as you're thinking about starting your business or even later as you get deeper into running your business. You can't lose fact of the most important thing, which you're really here for, and that is making sure that whatever it is you do, you do it in the context of having a happy and healthy life with your family. And you don't get so twisted chasing 
fame or glory or power or stuff that you forget about what's really important. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Wow. One more round of applause. Thank you. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty inspired. It takes a village, right? And we have a village here at the school. So thank you, everyone, for being here. Also, thank you to the digital audiences, whether it's live or whether you're watching this recorded. Thanks for investing time in yourself and maybe learning a little bit and getting inspired. Uh, we are very excited to announce the winners and give some awards. But before we do that, can we just really celebrate absolutely everybody that was here at whatever stage they were at? Yes. You know, it, it, it's kind of a funny saying, but like dreams happen every day and, some, and there are dreams starting right here. And that's, as an educator, so inspiring to me. So thanks everyone for being a part of that. At this point, I would love to invite up Dean Jesse Lee to announce the winners and hand over the awards. Sorry, my hands a little wet. <laughs> Before I do that, I just want to say thank you to everybody who uh, is a part of this event. This is our second annual uh, business pitch competition, and we will be having this every semester. So again, to the students uh, who, again, were uh, very brave to be here, thank you so much. This is just the beginning of your journey. And for the parents and friends and neighbors and folks who are supporting your uh, son, kids, neighbors, and so on and so forth, thank you for being here. Thank you for being part of their life. It's good to see the, the growth. And I want to point out Kevin uh, specifically. He was here for the first business pitch. He went on to finish third nationally in the HP competition two months ago at the national uh, competition. So it's just amazing. And again, this is just the start of your journey. We want you to be inspired. I was very inspired. And again, this is just a great way to start this chapter at City College San Francisco. Again, the Center for Entrepreneurship, we are in our third semester. And this is just an amazing thing that we're doing for our students. Again, everything that we do is for our students. And it's really to support you and to really foster uh, this, this sense of courage to go on and change the world. And thank you again for all that you're doing, Judges and John, for, for inspiring us. I do have a quote. I always share a quote. And it's a very simple quote, and I wish I knew who wrote it. Uh, it's a very appropriate one uh, for this event, and it's very short. And I'll just share it, and then I'll announce the winners. Um, you are braver than you believe, stronger than you seem, and smarter than you think. So let me say that again. It's, it's great. You are braver than you believe, stronger than you seem, and smarter than you think. So please, please, at the end of the day, believe in yourself. That's what this is about. Have courage, and don't give up. And I hope one day you will come back and tell us how successful you've been, and tell us your success story. But again, at the end of the day, whatever you do, ideas may not go as far as you'd like, but don't give up. This is why we're here to support you. And that's what we are here to do as the Center for Entrepreneurship is to be your resource center as you aspire to get to that chapter in life, to be that successful entrepreneur. So please think of us. Please come back to us. And please remember us. And again, please inspire others as well as you pursue your journey in life. Okay? So anyways, I just want to share that quote. And I do have awards to give to the judges, but I will give it to them and... Say thank you again for being a part of this. So your name is uh, appropriately in that. So thank you, Ian. Thank you, Sandy, Anne, and thank you, Lauren, and John. Thank you so much as well. All right. We have the top three, and in no particular order, everybody here did great. Everyone who pitched did great. But these three stood out. And again, thank you, judges. And I don't want to butcher. Uh, anything. So thank goodness I uh, don't have to do any beauty pageant competition recognition. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, again, in no random order, the first winner uh, is the Threshold Petition. <laughs> Congratulations. And if you don't mind, I'm going to have you stand up here. We're going to take a group picture later. Okay? Congratulations. The second is out. Out.
So again, I don't have your name uh, on this certificate, but again, thank you for doing that. Okay. And the third is uh, Be Gorgeous. Be Gorgeous. <laughs> So we're going to have a photo moment. Uh, so top three, please uh, be careful. Three women. Ladies. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, Thank you very much, ladies. Congratulations. <clears throat> and for the folks who uh, missed out earlier, thank you so much. Uh, these three folks will get to go to the um, Startup Grind Conference in February. It is an amazing conference. So you all will get free admission to this two-day conference in Woodwood City. Okay. So uh, thank you all. Uh, I will turn it over to our business department chair, yep. Yep. Leo Bello. But before we do that, I really want to say a most uh, appreciative thank you, kudos to Vivian Faustino Pulliam. Uh, she is really the bedrock of the Center for Entrepreneurship, and I really want to recognize Vivian. So thank you, Vivian, for everything that you're doing. This is truly a team effort, uh, and again, this is happening because Vivian is just so passionate about what we're doing. And again, because of Vivian, we are just... Uh, doing great things for all of you. So thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Leo Bello. Good evening, everyone. My name is Leo Bello. I'm the uh, chair of the uh, business department. I want to thank you all for being here. I was going to say this evening, but it started today. Wow. Again, thank our judges. Thank our uh, special guest pitchers. Uh, what a great way to start, right? And all of you that stayed here. Um, Good thing is we didn't have to pay you to be here. That's good. <laughs> anyway, I hope, as I did, in listening to all the pitches, right, all the different subjects, all the different topics, also all the different styles. As Ian has mentioned, everyone's got a different style, right? Yet your message is there. Some were phenomenal. I mean, some will be. Again, it's, a, it's always a start. A little bit of uh, housekeeping, though. Did everybody get a survey? Sorry, I'm always thinking... <laughs> Yes, please, make sure you got a survey, fill it out. That's the way we sort of gauge. We get to go to the powers of B and ask for more money. Are they still here? No, but we'll, we'll knock on their door and ask for money, right? It's always about the money. Again, I want to thank you for being here. I do want to, one more time, bring up Vivian. Vivian, she is so <laughs> modest. Come here, please. Yes. She really is the one that put this together. Our, our department just houses, but we're growing together. We're a, a team, but to tell you the truth, she's not only, she is the lead person. So when they say the lead person, she is the take charge. And what a tribute to the three that won today. Girl power, right? <laughs> uh, guys, we got to step up our game. Anyway, Vivian, a quick, just a quick thank you. I don't even want to say anything, but thank you very much for everyone. And you guys are telling Vivian, it's actually a team effort. This is not going to happen without the support of everyone in this room. The judges, the faculty, the staff, the students volunteer. It takes a village. And I really would like to show that it's always collaboration. And I hope that if some of you would go somewhere as a student, you would come back and help support the center. And in that case, you're not only supporting the center, but we're supporting the entire community. So thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to another pitch event with you and for all your support. Thank you. All right. With that, we want to say thank you for joining us for our third biannual pitch competition. We are concluding. And just a couple of housekeeping reminders. Students, um, also judges, if you have time and weren't interviewed, if you don't have time, it's late, that's OK. But students, please stick around so you can share some of your experience um, over here with Bima. That would be wonderful. Um, turn your surveys in. Travel safely. Have a good weekend. Go eat and take care.
And there is food. There's food. Eat here. Yeah. You don't have to go far. Yeah. <laughs> and I think the judges, one of the judges actually has a book that she would like to share with some of you. And, you know, my students, please, you can network with the judges. This is your opportunity to, you know, meet some of them. So... John just said, just you have to move, you have to launch. Oh, students, Michelle is going to interview you, so yeah. you, can hang, you can hang out. Let yeah. me actually still this. We just, um, I just have one more request. Three winners, judges, and our founders over here. If we could have a group photo, we would really appreciate it. Again, so the three winners, judges, and founders over on this side, we would appreciate it. Thank you.